Interior Secretary Ken Salazar and the head of the newly created Bureau of Ocean Energy Management testified on Capitol Hill today about new rules for offshore oil and gas drilling. They appeared before the House Natural Resources Committee. In about two and a half hours, testimony on the BP oil spill from a representative of the Ocean Conservancy and a Louisiana State University professor. Committee on Natural Resources will come to order. Just as a way of housekeeping, I'm sure all members already know at approximately 1030, we're going to have uh, four uh, votes on the House floor so we can plan accordingly. The committee is meeting today to conduct a hearing on discussion draft amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3534, the CLEAR Act. The CLEAR Act, introduced last year, was the subject of two days of hearings last September and was developed as a result of a long series of investigations, hearings, and prior legislative efforts <coughs> excuse me, into the pressing need to reform both the offshore and onshore oil and gas leasing program. Since I became chairman of this committee in 2007, we've held 20 hearings had nine GAO reports done and passed three bills out of the House during the last Congress prior to the introduction of the CLEAR Act on matters it concerns. The focus of the introduced version of this legislation is on royalty reform and enhanced planning process for energy development on the Outer Continental Shelf and an improved means to make federal lands available for renewable energy leasing. The bill also se seeks to fully fund the Land and Water Conservation Fund and establish a new oceans restoration fund based on the premise that we take everything from the ocean, but we put nothing back into it. Further, it would have eliminated the Minerals Management Service and replaced it with a new entity. The disaster which struck the Gulf of Mexico beginning on April 20th was indeed a game changer. As a result of a number of hearings by this committee, since that date, intensive investigations and review of documents submitted by all the parties involved in the Deepwater uh, Water Horizon incident, the substitute retains but builds upon the introduced version of H.R. 3534 in three main respects. First, it includes a focus on safety, not in a prescriptive fashion, which I believe may lead to freezing the development of new technology in its place, but in a more performance-based approach that mirrors the successful efforts of other countries, such as Norway and the United Kingdom. Second, taking a lead from our witness today, the Secretary of Interior, Ken Salazar, it replaces the formal min former Minerals Management Service with three entities separating leasing, policing, and revenue management, and provides an organic act for the new Bureau of Energy and Resource Management Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement and Office of Natural Resources Revenue. And third, the substitute would establish a Gulf of Mexico restoration program to provide an explicit statutory basis for what will be a long-term effort to address the devastating impacts of the Deepwater Horizon disaster on the environment and on local communities. And I would note that none of the funds authorized or made available under the substitute may be used to pay for any cost for which BP is liable. I would like to emphasize that the heading of the substitute clearly reads discussion draft, discussion draft. It was made available one week ago and we will not go to markup until July 14th. Therefore, I am providing ample opportunity for all interested parties to provide us with their views on this document. And I hope that will go out to members of the committee that are not physically present today via their staffs. I urge my colleagues who wish to see changes or offer amendments to the substitute to contact the committee as soon as possible as the markup will occur on the second day after we return from the July 4th recess. And I would like to be able to provide the markup vehicle to the committee as soon as possible prior to our return. I now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Hastings of Washington. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, this hearing today should continue to focus on the crisis unfolding in the Gulf of Mexico because at this very moment the well is not capped and oil is still leaking. Oil is washing onto wetlands and beaches, threatening the environment and the wildlife. Families are out of work. Businesses are struggling to make ends meet. 
and the Gulf states are still struggling to get the resources they need to respond to the spill. Unfortunately, instead of addressing the immediate crisis at hand, there have been attempts to use this tragedy to impose a job-killing cap-and-trade national energy tax and push legislation that is unrelated to the spill uh, or reforms in offshore drilling. Just yesterday, President Obama's senior energy and environmental uh, advisor, Carol Browner, wrote an email message advocating, uh, and I and quote in part, the disaster in the Gulf be used to end our addiction to fossil fuels and pass comprehensive energy and climate legislation, end quote. The ongoing attempt by Democrats to exploit this crisis in order to push a national energy tax is clearly their best effort not to let a crisis go to waste. But it will not stop the leak. It will not provide relief to the people struggling in the Gulf. It will, however, make the problem worse by increasing energy prices for all Americans and sending American jobs and, uh, and companies overseas. The bill we are discussing today was promoted as addressing the Deepwater Horizon oil rig explosion. However, most of its 200 pages have very little to do with this explosion, explosion and spill. There are numerous provisions completely unrelated to offshore drilling, safety and reform. Reforms are clearly needed to make American offshore drilling the safest in the world. But Congress should not get ahead of the facts and uh, in a rush to write new laws. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if all of us were to ask ourselves if we believe we have all the facts and information necessary to know exactly what changes need to be made in offshore drilling, the only honest answer is no. There is too much we don't know yet. There are, bipartisan, bi there are bipartisan documents requests that have gone unanswered by the administration regarding the government's oversight of this specific well. This includes the last inspection report on the blowout preventer. Information has come to, to light about human errors that contributed to the explosion, but we still don't know why the emergency shutoff fails, failed to work. The blowout preventer is still a mile beneath the ocean surface and we likely won't have the answers on what went wrong until it's retrieved and examined. Numerous investigations are underway, including the Presidential Commission, which has yet to even hold its first meeting. Why spend taxpayers' dollars on this commission if Congress has no intention of reviewing and considering its report and finding? Congress must know what caused the disaster and then respond appropriately. This will ensure that Congress isn't just making reforms for headlines and for political purposes, but making the right reforms to ensure that American drilling is the safest in the world. Finally, it is vital that these, in these tough economic times that Congress knows what effect proposed new laws will have on American jobs, our economy, and our dependence on foreign energy. As we've seen from the administration's moratorium on deep well drilling, impulsive decisions can have severe long-term economic impacts. Solutions are supposed to help improve the situation in the Gulf, not make it worse. Congress must take extra care to ensure that any reforms will not cause greater economic damage than is already being felt as a result of this spill. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. The Chair will move uh, directly now to hear from uh, our first panel, composed of the Honorable Ken Salazar, the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Interior, and he is accompanied by, and I understand the Director will have a statement to make as well, the Honorable Michael Bromwich, the Director of the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, Regulation and Enforcement, otherwise known as BOE, from the U.S. Department of Interior. Mr. Secretary, we welcome you once again to the committee. And as I have done many times publicly, I commend you and your department for the uh, tremendous manner in which you have responded to this disaster. Uh, you've put all your resources available, and uh, I commend you for uh, uh, that response. You may proceed as you desire. Thank you uh, very much, Chairman Rahal and uh, Ranking Member Hastings and uh, distinguished uh, members of, uh, of this committee. Uh, we continue our efforts on this day 71 with uh, what has been a relentless effort to deal with the problem that we see unfolding in the Gulf. Uh, at the President's uh, direction, uh, we are not resting and we will continue to move forward until uh, we have the solutions both with respect to 
the leak containment as well as uh, continuing the reform efforts that uh, we have been undertaking. I thought I would do a couple of things at the outset. First, to uh, bring the committee up to date on what is happening with respect to uh, the, uh, the leak containment and the efforts to kill the well. First, uh, on the containment measures, uh, in the last 24 hours about 25,000 barrels of oil were actually collected and contained and uh, have been captured notwithstanding some high seas that have been as high as uh, 7 feet. And so that interim containment system is working. Secondly, over the next uh, few days, the uh, containment capacity that will uh, be built out that we have been overseeing and working on will reach a capacity of 40 to 53,000 uh, barrels a day. And by mid-July, the capacity that will be built out will be 60 to 80,000 barrels a day. Uh, as a part of the effort of the uh, Federal team, which includes Secretary Chu and myself, uh, the Navy and others who have been uh, involved in this effort uh, from the beginning, including our oversights at Houston. We have ordered uh, these measures to be taken by BP so that uh, we get to full leak containment and also that there are redundancies and uh, efforts put into place to deal with contingencies like hurricanes. And so our hope is that uh, moving into mid-July, the 60 to 80,000 barrels of oil will be able to contain uh, most of the pollution currently emanating in uh, the Gulf of Mexico and then uh, moving upwards from there with uh, additional redundancies that are also being planned up to about 90,000 barrels a day if that should ever be needed. Secondly, uh, we have always known that, um, that what ultimately the uh, solution here is to kill this well. And as of this morning, uh, the current depth is now over 17,000 feet uh, through the relief well. Uh, the relief well will, uh, has a target of uh, 17,758 feet. So in the next several weeks, they'll be getting down to the target depth, and then hopefully the efforts uh, to kill uh, this well will, uh, will, will then move uh, forward. So that's a quick update uh, on what's happening with respect to at least uh, the source containment. There are huge efforts underway to fight the uh, oil uh, on the sea and near shore and onshore. Uh, over 7,000 vessels are involved, nearly 40,000 people. Uh, President, uh, in the early days, uh, through conversations with Secretary Gates, Secretary Napolitano and I, ordered uh, the authorization of the Coast Guard. Uh, so far, the states have called up around uh, 2,000 2, members of the Coast Guard to help in the fight. Uh, there's still another 18,000 members that could be called up if the governors themselves were to decide that uh, that's what they, that they want to do. Let me uh, move over quickly to the subject of uh, this legislation and uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy uh, Regulation and Enforcement. Uh, last year in September, I believe uh, the 19th, I testified in front of uh, this committee. Uh, and Chairman Ray Hall at the time, I indicated to you that you uh, were a pioneer and this committee was really pioneering an effort uh, that was long in coming. And I said that because I recognized then, as I recognize today, that when you have an agency that has uh, such a critical, responsible uh, set of missions, the collection on the average of $13 billion a year on behalf of the American taxpayer, and assuring that the oil and gas production, which is so important to this country, is conducted in a safe manner, that organic legislation is, in fact, necessary. So you were there, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, and many members of this committee long before uh, this tragedy uh, was there. And I remember testifying in support of you moving forward with that organic legislation. Uh, I think uh, the events of the last 71 days have made it all the more clear uh, that a, an agency of this importance uh, needs to have that organic legislation. Now, I won't go over the facts that I've gone over in other times, but uh, we have moved forward in the last 16 months uh, with the very strong efforts on ethic, ethics reforms and hired uh, former U.S. attorneys and independent uh, prosecutors to essentially oversee this agency. There have been people who have been terminated, people who, uh, have, uh, who no longer have jobs because of the ethics lapses of the past. That will now continue uh, under uh, Mike Brown, which we have made major movement forward with respect to the Outer Continental Shelf and the plans that had been put out there uh, prior to us coming on board uh, in, as Secretary of Interior. We have opened up a whole new chapter to uh, renewable energy and are looking very much forward to working with all of you as uh, we stand up uh, offshore wind energy, especially in the Atlantic uh, in the years ahead. And finally, uh, in the last uh, two budgets, we have uh, moved increasingly to have the kinds of resources that can uh, start policing these efforts in the OCS. Uh, from 2000 to 2008, uh, the budgets for MMS essentially were flatlined. Uh, the budgets of the President, the budgets that this Congress have approved over the last uh, couple of years have helped us uh, get to the point. But having said that, there is going to be significant additional resources that will be needed. Uh, Chairman Ray Hall and Ranking Member Hastings and members of the committee 
if we are to do the job that you all expect uh, the Department of Interior to do relative to assuring uh, safety in the OCS and development of oil and gas, as well as ensuring that the environment uh, is, uh, is protected. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, what I would like to do is uh, uh, turn it over to uh, Mike Bromwich, uh, the Director of the Bureau of Ocean Energy, for, uh, for his comments. Mr. Director, our condolences, I mean congratulations to you on your new position. <laughs> and uh, we look forward to working with you. You come from an impeccable background, which is uh, quite impressive, and certainly uh, you are the man for the job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Hastings, and other distinguished members uh, of the committee. There is a prepared statement that really goes mostly into my background uh, that I gather is in the record, and so I, I won't talk about that. I will be very brief. Uh, I want to talk uh, about three concrete things that have been done in the, in the eight days that I have now been uh, on the job as the head of the agency. Uh, the first is the renaming of the agency uh, from the former MMS to the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management Regulation and Enforcement. That was a decision by the Secretary uh, to demonstrate that the, there is going to be a changed and renewed focus for the agency uh, and that the focus is going to be now on proper uh, and forceful uh, regulation and enforcement in a way that had not been uh, the case over the prior years. So the name is symbolic, but it is also real uh, and it reflects a commitment to uh, a new purpose and a new attitude towards regulation and enforcement. The second is the creation of an internal unit within uh, the Bureau, uh, which we are calling the Investigations and Review Unit. Uh, it was something I proposed to the Secretary uh, on my first day. It is something he approved on my second day. Uh, and it is something that now exists and we are looking to staff it as quickly as possible. This new unit, the IRU, uh, will be staffed with experienced prosecutors, uh, investigators, scientists and other personnel that will allow us to uh, undertake prompt and aggressive enforcement action, both with respect to allegations of misconduct against people in my agency but also with respect to companies and other participants in the industry uh, that we regulate. I am determined to be aggressive. This unit will help me be aggressive. And I am determined to be prompt uh, in bringing appropriate uh, enforcement action. Uh, the third and final point is something that I want to announce uh, this morning, which is that we are imposing a fine of $5.2 million on BP America. Uh, for false, um, inaccurate and misleading reports submitted over uh, a long period of time on energy production uh, on the southern Ute tribal lands in southwestern Colorado. Uh, a lot of the work was done by southern Ute tribal auditors who initially discovered the problems. The problems were brought to the attention of BP America. The problems were not fixed. And as a result, uh, we concluded uh, that the reporting violations were not accidental. Uh, but in fact knowing and willful. This has been in the works for a while. Uh, it is not something that I produced in eight days. I think it is a reflection of the hard and serious work that people in my agency have done over time. But it does reflect a seriousness of purpose and an intent to be aggressive uh, in pursuing violations of companies' obligations in their dealing with royalties and other aspects of the programs under my Bureau of Supervision. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, that concludes my opening statement. And I'm obviously happy to answer any questions that I can later on. Thank you, Director Bromwich, for uh, that announcement that you just made this morning. I commend you and uh, members of your agency that have so diligently been pursuing this issue for a number of years now. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I I'm well aware of your support for protecting our American landscapes and your support for the great American outdoors. Uh, in your opinion, would the full funding of the LWCF uh, in this bill help you in those efforts? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, President, the answer is yes. President Obama uh, has uh, initiated a uh, conversation with America called the America's uh, Great Outdoors Effort. There have been listening sessions in places like Montana and uh, Maryland. There will be some in Colorado and all over this country. And our view uh, has been that it is uh, time for America to move forward uh, with a new conservation agenda that meets the, the needs and challenges of the 21st century. And as uh, the Chairman is uh, well aware, uh, the Land and Water 
Conservation Fund, frankly, has not been uh, funded since its creation in the 1960s. And so how we move forward with that is something that uh, I think is important, and uh, we look forward to working with you and uh, the members of, of Congress on that issue. Thank you. Uh, as you're no doubt aware, there have been many parallels between this disaster in the Gulf of Mexico and a disaster that struck in my congressional district just a couple of weeks before the Deepwater Horizon when we lost 29 brave coal miners in a coal mine tragedy. There are those that say uh, we should wait for the results of ongoing investigations before doing anything, before moving forward, even though unsafe conditions are already well documented and continue to exist after the tragedies have occurred. Uh, do you believe that Congress should wait for the results of ongoing investigations before trying to move forward on the type of legislation we're discussing today? Uh, or is there a need to move forward now? There is a uh, need to move forward and to move forward uh, with urgency, uh, Chairman Rahal. And uh, frankly, the sooner that uh, action is taking, the action that we are taking, the action that we are asking the Congress to help us with, uh, the faster it is that, that we're going to be able to get uh, beyond the tragedy and uh, start standing up again uh, the uh, OCS effort in a way that can be done in, in a safe manner and uh, protective of the environment. So uh, in my view, uh, waiting uh, is not an option. And let me ask you a further question about this pending legislation. When devising safety standards in legislation, do you think Congress should devise a more performance-based system? Or do, we demean, or do we need to be more prescriptive? For instance, would it be a good idea for Congress to specify in law how many blind shear rams should be on a blowout preventer? Uh, let me uh, say, uh, Chairman Rahal, the uh, organization which uh, we created, I created through a secretarial order that uh, splits up the organization in the way they described it earlier, was. Uh, in fact, an organization that we developed uh, based on uh, looking at uh, Norway and looking at the United Kingdom as well, where um, after uh, tragedies that they had had there with respect to OCS development, they came in and looked at how they were regulating uh, the oil and gas development in the oceans. And so that was a manifestation of, of the organizational effort that we have created through secretarial order. The uh, standards um, that are to be used is something that uh, Mike Bromwich uh, will be developing, and in part it will be the implementation of the safety recommendations uh, which the President directed uh, be delivered to him uh, on uh, May the 28th, and those recommendations have been delivered to him. Now on the question of what is, uh, what is uh, mandatory versus uh, what is uh, performance-based, that is something that we will be working on in, in the days and, and weeks ahead. You know, I, I have a uh, personal view on some of these issues, uh, but I have not yet had an opportunity to work with uh, Mike on some of these issues. Uh, so I, maybe it would be a good idea for him to comment on that just very briefly. Okay, but you see where I'm going. I, I don't want to freeze in place today by prescriptive standards uh, that forbids changes that occur in technology. As we all know, whether it's open heart surgery procedures or cancer surgery, you don't want to freeze in place what we have today, knowing advances that are still likely to be made in the future. Uh, let me respond. Law. We don't uh, want to freeze in law. I, I agree with you totally on that, uh, Chairman Ray Hall. And I think that one of the things that's going to happen as a result of uh, the Deepwater Horizon, uh, looking at all of the different issues that occurred here in many days before the explosion on April 20th, is that uh, there will be uh, a lot to be learned. And in fact, today, what is happening in the subsea at 5,000 feet is nothing short of uh, the Apollo 13 uh, project and trying to bring that home. And so technology uh, that will be developed uh, is something that's very important. And so I do think that there ought to be uh, the flexibility to the Bureau of Ocean Energy uh, uh, Enforcement and Regulation and to the Department of Interior to make sure that we are able uh, to develop uh, those standards uh, in a form that takes advantage of, uh, of the lessons learned. Director Robert. I agree with that. Uh, I, I think that the risk of being too prescriptive is that the prescriptions will be quickly overtaken by new technology. So it may be appropriate to establish certain baselines that are prescriptive. But I think, as the Secretary has just said, it is critical to allow enough flexibility and discretion for the agency to respond appropriately to developments in technology over time. Okay, my time has expired. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to uh, yield my time to Mr. Cassidy, but Mr. Secretary, before I, I do uh, on two other matters unrelated to this hearing, uh, the pill payment issue and the monument issue, 
I'll be sending you a letter today and we would uh, like to have a full and complete response to those questions. So I just wanted to give you a heads up that letter is going out today on an issue that we've had correspondence on in the past. But with this, I want to yield to my uh, colleague from Louisiana, whose state obviously is impacted. So Mr. Cassidy. Thank you, Mr. Hastings. Uh, Mr. Secretary, um, in the Department of Interior brief that was filed in Judge Feldman's court in New Orleans, DOI denies that there is irreparable economic harm because of this, what we call back home jobs moratorium. Now, uh, given that 20,000 jobs will be directly, 20,000 people will be laid off directly, and as many as 100,000 will be indirectly affected, those are fairly conservative estimates. Is that not irreparable harm? Congressman uh, Cassidy, I appreciate the question and uh, the economic issues at stake, and we recognize that there are economic consequences uh, to the moratorium that we impose. We uh, believe uh, that the moratorium was correct uh, when we uh, put, put it into place, and we believe it continues uh, to be correct uh, because the dynamic situation that we see unfolding in the Gulf today. But, but, one but just because I have limited time, is that not irreparable harm? 20,000 jobs lost directly, maybe 100 more indirectly. Is that not irreparable harm? I would say the greater irreparable harm would be if there was another blowout where there is not the oil response capability to even deal with the current Deepwater Horizon, horizon blowout. And the greater irreparable harm would be if you have a devastation of the Gulf Coast and uh, its communities in a way that cannot be recovered. And so our uh, program is comprehensive you. moving forward. I just have limited time. I don't mean to be rude. I'm very sorry. So the, your collection of engineers from the National Academy of Engineering, uh, they said, they go through this, and they said that a blanket moratorium is not the answer. It will not measurably reduce risk further, and it will have a lasting impact on the nation's economy, which may be greater than that of the oil spill. Now here are eight experts gathered by the department to make a decision and they feel as if the experts, the science, not whatever, uh, that this, this is not highlighted. I could go through more. A blanket moratorium will have the indirect effect of harming thousands of workers and further impact state and local economies suffering from the spill. We would, in effect, be punishing a large swath of people who were and are acting responsibly and are providing a product the nation demands. A blanket moratorium does not address the specific causes of this tragedy. We do not believe punishing the innocent is the right thing to do. We encourage the Secretary of Interior to overcome emotion with logic and to define what he means and they go on. Now how these are the experts, these are the scientists, so to speak, of petroleum engineering. What do you know differently than what they recommend? First, uh, Congressman Cassidy, their job was to help us with the safety report to the President, uh, and they did, and I appreciate uh, their help. I have met with them uh, subsequent to that report, and we'll continue to get their input as well as the input from others on, on safety measures. Uh, secondly, the, the question of the moratorium was a policy call, which I made, and there are two fundamental questions that need to be answered. Uh, one, uh, do we have the oil spill response uh, capability? Uh, number two, uh, can we ensure ourselves that we can move forward without the possibility of uh, creating this kind of uh, disaster again? How can we minimize that? Now, and let me ask this, because again, in your, in your report here, uh, you state that um, per the regulations, the advanced permit to drill requires technically detailed descriptions of well-designed criteria, casing, cementing, and blowout protector systems. This is page six of your brief. These fellows, they're all men, so I'll call them fellows. Uh, these fellows, in their very first page, say that we believe the blowout was caused by a complex and highly improbable chain of human errors coupled with several equipment failures and was preventable. Now, they're not saying that this is something which is a black box which we peer into and cannot know an answer. Rather, they're saying it is defined and they produce this white paper which um, I'm sure you're familiar with, which are safety recommendations which can be implemented now. And indeed, per your brief filed with Judge Feldman, you could look at those plans they have for drilling right now and decide whether or not they meet the best practices outlined in this white paper. 
Again, why not do that and preserve these 20,000 jobs? Okay. Let, me, let me answer the question in the broadest sense because I think members of the committee and Mr. Chairman, uh, you and uh, others have a, a great interest in where we are on the issue of the moratorium. We had uh, three choices in front of us. Okay. The first is uh, to simply move forward and pretend that nothing uh, had happened and that uh, another incident like this uh, could never happen again. And there were some who were advocates of that. Okay. We had another option, uh, which uh, some were advocates of, and that is that we bring to an end uh, production in the oceans of America. Okay? Uh, so that was a stop button. Uh, the President and I uh, chose to move forward with a pause button because we believe that we have to learn some lessons to make sure that this incident does not happen again. Now, as we move forward, uh, we will adjust accordingly based on information that we develop, uh, based on our ability to ensure uh, safety and environmental protection. And so that is part of the process uh, which we are undergoing at this point in time. I yield back. You have been generous, Mr. Chairman. Um, Gentlemen, time has expired. Uh, chair will recognize by the order in which they were here on the majority side, uh, Mr. Heinrich from New Mexico. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Mr. Secretary. Uh, I've got a few questions, mostly regarding mostly regarding onshore reform. Uh, as you know, my home state, uh, unfortunately, we are not blessed with the uh, oceanfront property of some of my colleagues on this committee. So I'm going to focus largely on onshore. Um, what is the department doing to address some of the challenges that we've seen uh, in the southern part of of your home state and the northern part of my home state with split estate uh, issues? Uh, oftentimes where, where the minerals are federally held, the surface is privately held, and there are a number of inherent challenges and conflicts that tend to, to pop up uh, with those, between those surface owners and the, uh, the folks who lease uh, the minerals underneath those areas. Congressman Heinrich, on, on your specific question on the split estates, uh, I will have uh, Director uh, Bob Abbey get back uh, to your office on uh, what it is that we are doing uh, within, within BLM there. I will say this, that with respect to uh, onshore issues and how they are addressed in, in this legislation, they are uh, important issues for us and we have moved uh, forward on a uh, reform effort uh, that has included a number of different things, elimination of royalty and kind, which applies both to, uh, uh, offshore as well as onshore, uh, moving forward with uh, the uh, categorical exclusions issues uh, within BLM and uh, having uh, the right kind of balance, in my view, in terms of how we protect the environment and conservation efforts and at the same time allow development uh, to occur. Um, my own sense uh, on this legislation, because it does deal with both uh, BLM and uh, with what was formerly MMS, is that we have a, a crisis right now in our hands uh, relating to the Outer Continental Shelf. But there are some additional reform efforts uh, related to onshore oil and gas development that I would be very happy uh, to work uh, with all of you and uh, seeing how we might be able to make improvements there as well. Thank you. Uh, uh, you may have answered this when the, uh, when the chairman started, but uh, does the administration have a, a position on full funding of the LWCF? You know, the uh, administration's uh, position on uh, the Land and Water Conservation Fund is that they would like to see full funding of the Land and Water Conservation Fund. So if you look at uh, the President's budget for this year and moving forward in the years ahead, it does achieve what was the uh, full funding level at uh, $900 million. Uh, I would say that this is a time uh, for all of us to really reexamine what the commitment uh, to conservation really is for the United States. I think when Stuart Udall uh, from your home state, uh, Congressman Heinrich and, and others uh, sat down with uh, Robert Kennedy and, and others and thought about the concept of the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Their thoughts were that we took our American resources from our earth and that we should return something back to the earth with respect to some of the money needed for conservation. Uh, in my own personal view, and this is just my personal view, uh, that is a promise unfulfilled. Uh, because, in fact, uh, billions of dollars that uh, should have gone into Land and Water Conservation Fund have not gone there because they have been uh, diverted into other areas. I, I appreciate that very much. I think it is an incredibly important part of this legislation. Uh, I know you issued a secretarial order last year regarding renewables. 
Um, what is the status of the Department's response to that order and specifically um, are there, how are the fast track projects moving along? You know, I'm, I'm proud to say that that is uh, one of the reform efforts uh, which uh, uh, Director Abbey and my team have been working on very hard and Assistant Secretary Wilma Lewis. We are looking uh, still forward to uh, getting a December 1 uh, target date of uh, permitting uh, approximately 5,000 megawatts of uh, power, uh, mostly in solar uh, and wind and geothermal. I have been in places like uh, uh, very remote places in Utah, for example, where you have wind, solar, and geothermal projects combined that are actually up and running in Milford, Utah. Uh, and uh, so it is a very significant part of our new energy portfolio. And it's something that the President has uh, prioritized. It's something which we worked with uh, you and the Congress to make it happen. And I do believe it's going to happen. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. From Colorado, Mr. Lamborn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, everyone here, I believe and hope, agrees that our priorities need to be to stop the leak, clean up the oil, address the needs of the Gulf state communities, and hold BP accountable. Now, you have stated in the past that under your watch, the Department will take very seriously the importance of science and peer-reviewed documents submitted by experts. According to recent press reports and releases from the Department, after the recent offshore safety report was peer reviewed, it was then edited by political operatives at either the Department or the White House to assert against the recommendations of the re expert report signers that a six month OCS moratorium was appropriate. The experts then came out and denounced this manipulation. Two weeks ago, before the Energy and Minerals Subcommittee, I asked the Acting Inspector General if she would open an investigation into how these changes were made, who made these changes, and why those changes were misrepresented to the public as the work of the engineering professionals that the Department had contracted for the report. At the time, she stated that while she wasn't prepared to immediately declare that she would open an investigation, she could do so in the future. In order to ensure that she has the information she needs to make a comprehensive investigation, are you willing to cooperate with the Inspector General's investigation into the political manipulations of this report? Uh, Congressman Lamborn, uh, first, there are no political manipulations. Uh, my letter to the President, which uh, I personally authored, uh, is very clear in its statement. It uh, transmits uh, the 30-day report uh, to the President. And it uh, separates uh, my recommendation to the President, which is a policy matter relative to the, to the moratorium. Uh, the fact is that the role of the uh, engineers, which uh, I asked the National Academy of Sciences and National Academy of Engineering, they were part of a peer review process uh, with respect to the safety issues. And uh, I appreciate the work that they did very much. But at the end of the day, uh, the question of uh, whether or not we move forward uh, with uh, uh, drilling activity in, in the Outer Continental Shelf ultimately is a responsibility and duty under the law of the Secretary of Interior. It is not the responsibility of the engineers or anyone else. And so that was my decision, and I take full responsibility for that decision. Um, do you think it is appropriate to apologize to the American people for the wrong, wrongful interpretation that was put on the report? I do not think there is an apology that is uh, that's necessary, uh, Congressman Lamborn. The, the fact of the matter is that uh, I think that uh, what this crisis should tell you, uh, you being a member of Congress from my home state, uh, Doug, is that uh, we ought not to let uh, partisan politics or ideology essentially guide the issue which we face here in America today. We are in the midst of a dynamic crisis. It is an epidemic crisis, yes, like 9-11, yes, like other crises that we have faced, except this continues. It is not just a one-day thing that hit us. We are in day 71. We are going to be in it uh, for several more months. And uh, this is a time uh, for the United States to come together and say, we have a problem mm -hmm. and we are going to fix the problem. And I will tell you, uh, Congressman Lamborn, as uh, Secretary of the Interior, I am absolutely resolute and confident that the problem will be fixed and that this Gulf oil spill will serve as a catalyst to safer and more environmentally protective uh, production of oil and gas in the Outer Continental Shelf, that it will serve as a catalyst, sir, for moving forward with a Gulf Coast restoration
plan of this landscape of national significance and that this uh, Gulf spill will also serve as a catalyst for a new conservation agenda and to help us move into the new energy frontier. So I think if we as a country use the Gulf oil spill, this crisis, to really deal with these monumental issues of our time, uh, this crisis will be looked back 20 years from now in a very positive way by the American people. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I agree with you on what our goals and intentions are and need to be. And I agree that partisanship shouldn't be a part of that. Uh, I, I am troubled that the experts had to come out and denounce the statement that was made that they had called for a moratorium when they did no such thing. In fact, they said that it presents other competing safety problems by having just a blanket moratorium instead of a more nuanced and focused approach. So I'm, I'm just troubled that they had to come out and denounce that interpretation. Yeah, they, they have their points of view, and, and I appreciate and I respect their points of view, and I appreciate the points of view of members of, of Congress and, and other groups who have uh, communicated with us. Uh, I have met uh, with the engineers, including other engineers who were involved in that report, and I've had additional uh, conversations with them about their point of view on, on how we move forward uh, safely. You know, many conversations have been held with people about whether or not there is a, a part of uh, OCS, oil and gas development, that can be moved forward with appropriate demarcations made a demarcation with respect to shallow uh, water uh, production, and we are moving forward with that. There may be some other demarcations that are appropriate as well. Uh, but we are going to be thoughtful and we are going to do the right thing. And uh, I am not going to be pushed into doing uh, anything prematurely relative to additional development in the LCS. Thank you. We have time for one more questioner before breaking for votes. Uh, the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Bourne, is next, and I will leave it up to him to decide whether he would like to not yield his time but give way to the former chairman of this committee, uh, Mr. Miller of California, <laughs> to, ask questions, <laughs> to ask questions ahead of him. Mr. Chairman, uh, I was number 27 the last time that the, that the secretary was here, but out of deference to uh, my senior colleague, uh, Mr. Miller, I will yield all of my time Mr. Chairman. to him. Parliamentary inquiry. Was, 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 was that a unanimous consent request? <laughs> <laughs> I think that I think the gentleman. Uh, welcome, Mr. Secretary and and uh, 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 Director Bromwich uh, to to the committee. Uh, my question really is: At, at what point do uh, what is do, how do we decide who's going to get to play? Assuming that at some point there will be a resumption of oil drilling on the Outer Continental Shelf, that there are leases that have been let and they will be exploited. What is the criteria for, for companies to now drill upon uh, the American Outer Continental Shelf? Obviously, I have a very serious, long-standing concern with British Petroleum. Uh, in my other committee, in the Education Labor Committee, we have chronicled over many years, as has OSHA, uh, dangerous, uh, uh, lethal behavior by them, repeated time and again in the refineries, on the pipelines, and elsewhere under their jurisdiction. And now we see many of the warnings that we received over the last decade by independent commissions, from former Secretary of State James Baker's independent commission to the pipeline safety to, uh, uh, to Booz Allen, talking about cost cutting, about dangerous decisions that were ignored all the way to the boardroom, time and again. And I guess the question I have is I want to know are they going to be allowed to go back out onto what is a, 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 a very dangerous place, as we now see, for the environment, a critical uh, area to, uh, uh, to explore from oil, for oil? Uh, uh, are they going to be allowed to go out there or into the Arctic? Uh, I don't, uh, I'm sure they have the technical capabilities to do it. That's not what I'm concerned about. What I'm concerned about is, is, is the ethics of this company and how they have performed uh, in the past to measure their performance in the future. I think they should be debarred from participating in the Outer Continental Shelf for five or seven years. It will have little or no impact on the supply of fossil fuels to this country. This is one of the most competitive places, uh, one, of the, one of the prizes uh, to drill uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the world and with possibly some of the greatest re uh, returns to them. But at some point, the American people are entitled to a standard. They have, they have killed their workers before. 
They have refused to comply. They have paid some of the largest fines in history. I see that you just assessed them an additional fine for false, inaccurate, and misleading reports, which I assume is they misled the, the American public what they owed them uh, uh, on, those, uh, on those lands. Uh, and I just want to know how the department is going to handle this or how you think the Congress should handle this. Sort of like a poker game, you've got to have jacks or better to open. You ought to bring a safety record. You ought to bring a, a, a conscientious corporate policy to the Outer Continental Shelf at a minimum. The questions of whether or not the Outer Continental Shelf will be available or not in the future is a different decision. But which parties are going to get to play and what are the standards uh, that are going to be imposed? Congressman Miller, uh, first let me say that uh, the standards and enforcement are absolutely necessary for moving forward with uh, OCS uh, development, and that's something that uh, I've asked uh, Mike Bromwich uh, to work on with me and, and with others. And obviously, the 30-day report to the president on safety will be will be part of that. Secondly, uh, the question of uh, past performance of, of companies—it's uh, something that uh, I will work with Mike Bromwich to figure out uh, what it is that makes uh, the most sense here. And I would, uh, I would, I would uh, ask Mike uh, may perhaps to comment on, on that particular point and how you take into account the past performance of, of companies uh, relative to uh, whatever bar you might want to put into, into place. So, Director Bromwich? Yes. There are, there are new standards that have been created uh, industry-wide that have been issued within the last several weeks, one on safety and one on the environment. So they are already across the board new requirements and enhancements, but you raise a very important question, and that is with a record of bad performance, deadly performance, um, should you evaluate applications differently? It's something I'm eight days into the job that I don't have a firm conclusion on yet, but certainly it, it should be considered a relevant factor. It's also going to be a relevant factor as to what kind of uh, enforcement will be brought uh, with respect to violations in the future. It is perfectly appropriate, in my view, that if you have repeat offenders, if you have recidivists, uh, that should increase the enforcement penalties that are imposed. Well, I appreciate you saying that, and I, and I hope that uh, you will continue that, and it is up to the Congress to, to, to make that clear. But, you know, in the coal mine industry, in Mr. Rahal's district, we have, a, under MSHA, we have patterns of violations. And we see companies with horrible records that have been able to evade the law and continue to put miners in dangerous and deadly situations. I say this about BP because when I look at how they run complex refineries and the lives that they have put in jeopardy and the lives that have been taken, this is a complex workplace. And I am a little concerned that on the, question, on the, on the questions of process management standards that, are, that you are now starting to put into effect or you have out for comment, that those were created by the American Petroleum Institute, and no discussion with OSHA has taken place prior to very recently about those, about those standards. And OSHA has 40 years of experience working with these industries on those issues. And I would hope that those would not go uh, uh, to final uh, until there is an opportunity to walk this across that experience on how those, on how those processes it may be the most important indicator of preventing serious uh, explosive events taking place in the, in the chemical and the oil industry. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Miller, on that point, um, in connection with the joint investigation that is being conducted by my agency and uh, by the Coast Guard, uh, the expertise of OSHA is specifically being sought. So we are aware of the relevance of their work uh, to the work that we are doing now, uh, and I think that that I don't know whether that is a new recognition or not, uh, but it is a recognition that we now have uh, and plan to pursue in the future. Well, I, Mr. Rahal and I have both sent you a letter asking you to hold for a moment before you, those, those regulations that were developed by the Petroleum Institute, which may have very many good suggestions, but that shouldn't be the sole determinant of what is going forward. Thank you. I yield my time back to Mr. Bourne. No, Mr. Bourne still has it. <laughs> Mr. Bourne still has his full time when we come back after this series of votes on the floor. The committee will stand in recess until the votes are over. Natural resources will resume its sitting. And on the minority side, the next gentleman in order of recognition is Mr. Whitman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I 
appreciate the opportunity. Secretary Salazar, thank you so much for, uh, for your efforts. I did want to um, talk a little bit about uh, the current process of uh, lease sales. I know that we've halted, or you, your office has halted, the uh, Virginia's proposed OCS lease, uh, which is going to further delay, I think, some efforts there as far as looking at comprehensive energy. Uh, and I appreciate the pause. I know we have to stop and figure out what went wrong in the, in the Gulf and make sure that we're putting those practices in place as far as future efforts for offshore energy development. I do believe strongly, though, that we need an all-of-the-above energy policy. We need to make sure we're developing all of our sources of energy, making sure that the marketplace allows those to be lifted up as to which ones are the most efficient. And I support oil and gas development as part of that whole mix. I also uh, support wind development. Uh, and I know the administration had high hopes of developing offshore wind projects, and I appreciate your efforts to coordinate the mid-Atlantic states and study the issue. However, 17 months into this administration, MMS has only signed one commercial wind lease, held no lease sales, and there don't seem to be any scheduled. And on top of that, the permitting process looks like it will take years. I know as we've talked to folks, it's an extended process with a variety of EISs involved. And I know the agency has said, well, we're going to take that time because we're not exactly sure how to go about this. We haven't done these before. Uh, so I'm concerned that it's going to take a significant period of time uh, before any turbines can be built. And uh, Virginia, as you know, has significant wind resources, has significant interest here. We have a number of consortiums that are very interested in offshore wind development. And uh, my question is this, is if the administration is going to slow oil and gas development, uh, what can we expect to see with offshore wind? Are we also going to go through the same slow, methodical process with that, especially when we're looking at making sure we stand up all of these energy sources? Uh, thank you, Congressman uh, Women, and uh, thank you to you for your uh, service on the Migratory Bird uh, Commission and uh, your great work there with uh, Congressman Dingell uh, on uh, the conservation agenda for the country. Uh, with respect to the question on uh, offshore wind uh, in the Atlantic, uh, let me just say uh, that we are moving forward uh, as quickly as we possibly can. And I do have a SWAT team that I have assembled uh, within Interior to take a look at how we can uh, expedite uh, the effort. Uh, we have been working with all the states, have opened up uh, an office now in your state in Virginia that will be the Atlantic uh, Wind Renewable Energy Office. And uh, so this is a uh, high priority. Uh, and uh, we will make sure that on this one uh, we will not fall behind the rest of the world in developing offshore wind. I think that's critical with our, with our energy portfolio. Let me ask a little bit more, too, about the offshore oil and gas development. I know right now lease 220 site, the, the lease process there has been canceled. Uh, I'm hopeful that as we learn the, the processes and the problems that have occurred in the development in the Gulf, that we apply those, especially there in Virginia, because I know there's interest in making sure that that lease uh, process go forward. Uh, can you give us some, some idea about where you see uh, the future for uh, the, oil, the oil and gas lease off of Virginia as far as time-wise. I know, as I said right now, it's canceled, but do you see that, that process being picked back up after we go through the analysis and learning process here in the Gulf? Congressman, uh, first uh, let me say the President Obama and I have been uh, clear that uh, we see uh, an energy portfolio that, yes, uh, very much pushes uh, the new energy frontier for America. But at the same time, we recognize that oil and gas uh, is a part of our energy portfolio today. And so we will see uh, efforts uh, to continue to develop uh, oil and gas in, in the outer continental shelf. And we will learn the lessons from the Deepwater Horizon uh, to make sure that as it's developed, it can be done in a safe um, a way and, and in a way that protects uh, the environment with respect to Virginia. I would say this. Um, Lease sale 220 itself uh, still had to undergo uh, additional analysis, including additional environmental analysis. And there are important conflicts that you, Congressman Whitman, and the Governor and others need to be aware of relative to the Department of Defense and, and issues relating to that. That would all have come out in that process. Uh, so we look forward to working with you and uh, the Congressional Delegation of Virginia and, and others as we move forward. Very good. And one last question. In your testimony, you said that we're going to do everything and our power to make our affected communities whole. As you know, in the Gulf, obviously the seafood industry has been affected as well as the, the offshore oil and gas industry. 
as you know, that effect transcends the borders of the Gulf states. It also affects places like Virginia, who Virginia seafood processors, 65 percent of the oysters processed in Virginia come from the Gulf. So that, that effect extends beyond the Gulf states' boundaries. And I just wanted to make sure that, uh, that you are doing everything through your agencies to make sure that uh, we're focusing on uh, just not making folks whole in the communities in the Gulf, but also how it affects seafood communities in states like Virginia. And I know other East Coast states are also closely tied to the Gulf seafood industry. So I just wanted to make sure that you are aware of that and that uh, we have assurances that those things are going to be kept in mind as far as making sure that uh, we're, we're making our affected communities whole. Thank you, Congresswoman. The President uh, and uh, our team uh, put together uh, essentially the $20 billion uh, uh, escrow account, which is a uh, place where uh, claims uh, will be filed and uh, through an independent uh, uh, administrator, uh, there is an effort underway to make sure that legitimate claims are being uh, paid. And so uh, it will all be part of, uh, of that process where uh, claims uh, that are legitimate claims will be considered. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma and promises him he, the Chair will not take out of his time the minute and 43 seconds that Chairman Miller went over time. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, thank you so much for, for holding this hearing and, and for allowing me to ask a question. I uh, also, <laughs> also uh, want to thank uh, our panelists for being here today and, and also just want to say a special thank you. I know you all are living with this spill every day. Uh, I can't imagine the amount of stress you're under, um, you know, all the, the hours that you're putting into this. Uh, you know, we may disagree sometimes on uh, different points of policy, but I know that, um, you know, you're, your heart's in the right place and you're working really hard to try to get this thing cleaned up as soon as possible and to get this leak uh, stopped. So I do want to say thank you. Uh, to the Secretary, I also want to say thank you. Sometimes we've We've disagreed on, on energy policy at different uh, parts along the way, points along the way. But in Indian country, uh, I think we've worked really well together, uh, particularly helping out uh, my district in Oklahoma. Uh, I think you all are doing a uh, tremendous job on the MMS reforms, the ethics reforms, some of the things that you all are doing. Uh, some of the concerns that I have, uh, particularly in, in, relations to, in relation to the offshore uh, we do have some Oklahoma companies that have investments in the offshore. You know, they're not BP, they're not, you know, Exxon. I mean, these are these are smaller companies that um, uh, have some investments, and the moratorium is affecting them. As an example, you know, Samson, uh, which is based in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, because of the moratorium, it's costing them hundreds of thousands of dollars a day. And some of the, I've visited with some of the executives, some of them feel actually that it, it's unsafe um, to have these rigs and everything out there without a clear program and just kind of sitting out there for six months. So uh, as you, uh, you know, make your determination, as you take some of these um, uh, recommendations like Mr. Cassidy uh, pointed out, I hope you'll also take into, into uh, account the loss of jobs and uh, um, uh, that's going on. Now, uh, to, to the onshore, uh, I have some, um, some uh, information from IPAMS, and this is interesting. They, they sent us this paper. It says, uh, a natural gas and oil lease is a definite maybe. Maybe the lease will be issued within a reasonable time period after the sale. Maybe you'll get through all the environmental analysis and regulatory hurdles. <coughs> maybe you'll get permission to drill. Maybe your project won't be held up by legal challenges from obstructionist groups, and maybe you'll find oil and gas, but definitely you'll have to pay potentially millions of dollars. The natural gas and oil industry pays billions of dollars into the U.S. Treasury to obtain leases, $10 billion in 2008. Each lease is, at an, uh, is an at-risk investment with no guarantee that energy resources will be found or that it will return any revenue to the leaseholders. Um, BLM right now is, is currently holding about $100 million worth of unissued and suspended leases in Utah, Wyoming, and Montana and Colorado. That's $100 million of companies' capital that's being held by the federal government in, in a non-productive uh, capacity. And the draft language of, uh, of the bill, of the CLEAR Act, there's, as an example, and I would like you to touch on this, 
uh, there's a provision that eliminates non-competitive leasing. And so let's say you have a lease and only one company bids on the project. And, uh, uh, you know, th this is in an area where you're not having lots of companies bid on it because the geology is not proved up, because uh, there may not, you know, this may be a, what's called a rank wildcat in oil country. Uh, but some company decides, hey, we're going to put it on the line. We're going to drill up this lease uh, and pay for it. Uh, and here's some of the wildcat developments that have happened uh, recently. Uh, the Pinedale, Annie Klein in Wyoming, the Bakken Shale play in North Dakota, and Marcellus Shale in Appalachia. These are huge finds that would not have happened without some of this you know, wildcat uh, mentality. And I think under the draft of 35-34, uh, I'm worried about this non-competitive lease uh, piece. So as my time expires, anything that you can touch on on the, you know, hopefully in the six months on the offshore, let's maybe something can work out in that time frame to start it back up. And the second, the onshore, like the non-competitive leasing and making it harder for these companies to prove up uh, their assets. I, I'd like your, your thoughts on that. And again, thank you for, for your efforts. And we, we, uh, I do appreciate uh, John uh, being in my class. He uh, he's, gets gold stars for being your brother. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Boren. Uh, first, uh, I, I appreciate the, the comments on the other work that we do because uh, this department is a huge department. And uh, we continue to work hard on uh, the issues relating to First Americans, including in your state, uh, Cobell, and so many other issues that are very important to this department of the country. And so I'm proud of the team that we have that continues to work on that broad agenda. With respect to the two uh, questions that you um, ended your um, comments with, let me uh, take the, the six-month moratorium first. We're working on uh, that to see whether there's um, some adjustment and some additional demarcations that uh, might be able to be made. Uh, we'll have uh, more on that in uh, in, in the days ahead, uh, and we're, we're cognizant uh, of, of all the important factors here, including uh, protection of, uh, of workers and the safety issues, uh, protection of the environment, uh, as well as the economic uh, issues uh, relating to the moratorium. So those are very much all on, on our mind. Uh, and thirdly, with respect to your, uh, the issue concerning the CLEAR Act and uh, the uh, elimination of non-competitive leases, uh, let me say there have been significant reforms that we have undertaken within the Bureau of Land Management. Um, and in fact, uh, part of the reason that those reforms are necessary are to be responsive to that IPAM's uh, sense that uh, you always get a definite maybe. Um, frankly, in the last administration, leases were handed out like pieces of paper without doing the kind of proactive planning that is necessary. Uh, Director Bob Abbey and, and I have taken a different approach, and that is that uh, we, when, when leases are issued, we want to have more certainty that those leases are, in fact, going to be developed. Uh, now, if you get a lease, more than likely it's going to be subject to a protest because of the way that uh, the system has been uh, set up over time. We're changing those things, and it may be appropriate, uh, Congressman Warren, uh, at any time uh, for you to come and, and have a conversation with uh, Director Abbey and what we are doing in terms of those reforms at the BLM. And perhaps, Mr. Chairman, at some point, I know you have a very busy schedule here, but we would welcome the opportunity to provide uh, information on the BLM and what it is doing on the onshore uh, relative to this particular issue and others. Yeah, yes, most definitely, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The time has expired. The Chair will advise all members that the Secretary does have to leave at 1210. Director Bromwich will continue to remain with us, but as, as is always a practice, members can submit questions for the record. And I'm sure the Secretary or Director Bromage will get back to the respective members. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Dr. Brown. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, I want to go back to some question very briefly that Ms. Lamborn was, was giving you, and I don't think we got an answer. Just yes or no, will you cooperate with IG on this investigation about the disparity between your report and what the engineer said in theirs? Uh, Congressman Brown, uh, we have nothing to hide, and I'm willing to cooperate with anybody. I, I'm not aware of it. So is that a yes? The, the answer is yes. We'll cooperate Thank you with so anybody. Much. I appreciate it. Just in the sake of time, I apologize for cutting you off. I couldn't agree more with President Clinton's assessment last week that our priorities must be to fix the leak, keep the oil away from the shore, minimize the damage to the oil that reaches the shore, 
and find out who did what, uh, who did what wrong and hold them accountable. But we do need to, f to do the first three first. And let us never forget that the victims who must be made whole from this tragedy, and we cannot legislate, in my opinion, until we accomplish these priorities and discover what went wrong in the first place. Now is one time when, the, when this administration might want to put politics aside and let a serious crisis actually go to waste. I'd like to bring to the attention of this committee two letters that I sent to the administration last week, Mr. Chairman, in my capacity as ranking member of the House Committee on Science and Technology, Subcommittee on Investigations and Oversight, outlining a troubling pattern of politically motivated actions from this administration in dealing with the Gulf oil spill and demanding scientific integrity moving forward. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that two letters I've sent to the President and to Secretary Salazar be entered into the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In my letter to the President, I ask that additional members with broad technical expertise be added to the newly created National Commission on the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill and offshore drilling. Currently, only two scientists or engineers sit on that commission. I also requested that the Commission report to Congress, not just to the White House. Before pursuing legislative fixes, it might, be, it might make more sense to wait to, until this Commission and other investigations taking place finish their work. In my second letter, which I sent to you, Mr. Secretary, I discussed the, part, the Department of Interior's recently produced report titled, Increased Safety Measures for Energy Development on Outer Continental Shelf. As you're aware, the findings of this report were used to justify an offshore drilling moratorium in the Gulf. However, shortly after the report was released, we discovered that the administration had manipulated the findings of six of the eight peer reviewers from the National Academy, Academy of Engineering. The misrepresentation of the peer reviewers' recommendations in order to justify an offshore drilling moratorium presents troublesome patterns of how this administration views the role of science and technology relating to this disaster. This is not the first time that this administration's scientific integrity has been questioned. In addition, it appears that these politically motivated actions have become a bad habit with how the administration has dealt with the Gulf oil spill. The administration's misdirected focus during this crisis reeks of political opportunism. Mr. <clears throat> Secretary, the letter I sent you outlined previously defined principles of scientific integrity and raised many of the concerns I just mentioned. Can you please share with me the methods used to produce this report? Uh, Congressman uh, Brown, I'm happy to respond to those questions. And let me say uh, uh, three points. First, uh, in terms of timing relative to legislative action and uh, Go, the, the ongoing crisis at the Gulf Coast, uh, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, we can deal uh, with containing uh, this spill and killing this well and protecting uh, the great assets of, of the Gulf Coast, uh, but we can also move forward with uh, ideas like uh, some of the ideas which Chairman Ray Hall and, and others have championed in this committee in terms of uh, a reform agenda. It was September, I believe, 19th of last year when I appeared before this committee, and uh, one of the subjects that was uh, dealt with at that point in time was uh, an organic act for uh, what was then known as the MMS. So these are issues that have been in the hopper for a long time, and uh, they are issues which uh, I believe uh, can be dealt with and should be dealt with uh, now. And I also believe that the sooner that we deal uh, with these issues in terms of a legislative framework and providing the resources that are needed to be able to do the enforcement and, and the inspections uh, required. Uh, will allow us to get to uh, what many of you want to get to uh, sooner, and that is to have an OCS program uh, that can move forward uh, safely and, and protective of the environment. Secondly, with respect to uh, your um, statement on uh, misrepresentation, let me just say, um, with all due respect, Congressman Brown, you're wrong. Uh, there, there is nothing of the nature uh, as you speak. The letter, as I have testified in this committee, that I wrote to the President, uh, said that we were submitting uh, a set of safety recommendations. Those safety recommendations are part of what has guided our efforts with respect to the notice to lessees. It's uh, beginning to move forward with respect to a new safety regime uh, in the outer continental shelf. I also, in that letter, 
said I was recommending that we move forward with a moratorium. And uh, I believe the moratorium was right then. I believe the moratorium is right today because uh, we need to learn the lessons. And right now, is, I don't, won't, won't repeat what I've already said, but there are a number of issues that uh, need to be addressed uh, at this point. Mr. Secretary, I, uh, I certainly hope you can walk and chew gum at the same time, and I trust that you can. I respectfully disagree with you on the moratorium and from a scientific basis. And I would also uh, ask that the, a detailed response to my letter that I've just mentioned be provided in writing in a timely manner and include all the documents and draft related to the report. I would remind you that, our depart that your department and the administration must comply promptly with, con with congressional requests from a member of Congress, especially one who sits on two committees with jurisdiction over your department. And as far as your final comment, I think a lot of the American people believe that the decisions made just reek of, of a political agenda and not a scientifically uh, driven agenda. I believe yeah, very firmly that, uh, that um, policy cannot be made by science, but science can drive policy. And I hope that we can have scientific integrity. And I look forward to your response, Mr. Secretary. Thank you so much. Gentleman's time expired. Gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, is right Thank now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, the Obama administration has authorized uh, 17,500 National Guard troops to respond to this disaster in the four affected states, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida. However, it is only the governor of a state that can actually deploy these troops, and thus far only 1,675 are active. According to news reports, the governor of Louisiana has only deployed 1,053 troops out of 6,000 that has been authorized. Alabama has deployed 432 of 3,000. Florida has deployed only 97 of 2,500. And Mississippi has activated 58 troops out of 6,000. Mr. Secretary, this is the worst environmental disaster in our nation's history. There is a hurricane in the Gulf. Shouldn't the governors of these four states immediately deploy all of the National Guard troops that have been authorized to respond? Uh, Chairman, Chairman Markey, Congressman Markey, the answer is, uh, the, the answer is yes, as they are needed. And uh, Secretary Napolitano, uh, Director Browner, and myself, frankly, were in the Gulf Coast probably within, uh, we've been down there uh, 10 times there in Houston since it started. But we made a call uh, from the command center to uh, Secretary Gates and to the White House that essentially gave the authorization uh, to the states to move forward the Coast Guard uh, within a few days after this incident occurred. So it is, uh, for me, uh, frankly, uh, surprising that you do not, not have uh, the governors of these states uh, moving forward with uh, the deployment of these uh, National Guard's troops. And we know at the end of the day that those cleanup responsibilities ultimately are going to be paid for uh, by BP. I agree with you, Mr. Secretary. I think we should really have an all hands on deck mentality. Uh, and not using these National Guard troops at this time, I think, uh, really is a mistake. Mr. Secretary, we are now confronted with a situation in which hurricane season has arrived and the well <coughs> remains uncapped. Mr. Secretary, not only does BP's oil spill response plan for the Gulf of Mexico not adequately pre prepare for the event of a hurricane if there uh, was a spill, it does not contain the word hurricane. Mr. Secretary, I sent a letter to the BP today asking what preparations they had made for a hurricane in the spill response area. It is clear that BP wasn't prepared for this kind of a double whammy, a hurricane on top of an oil spill. Uh, we do know in the BP response plan that they are prepared to evacuate walruses from the Gulf of Mexico, even though no walrus has lived there in the last three million years. At the same time, BP did not mention the word hurricane uh, in their response plan. Do you believe, Mr. Secretary, that not just BP but every oil company should, has a responsibility to actually have as part of their spill response capability the ability to deal with a hurricane? I do. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, and uh, has, have, have you talked to them right now about the level of preparation they have for a hurricane? Yeah, we have uh, been approached uh, by uh, all the major companies that have any significant ongoing activity in the Gulf of Mexico with a request uh, that the moratorium that we have in place uh, be lifted. 
you know, one of the questions that I asked uh, these companies, and they were all the executives of these companies, was uh, do you believe that there is a capability right now uh, to respond to another oil spill if one were to occur in the Gulf of Mexico? And uh, those are the kinds of uh, questions uh, that need to be asked and uh, they need to be answered uh, before there is any lifting of the moratorium. Well, I have introduced legislation to require oil companies to have real safety response plans that don't plan on protecting walruses in the Gulf and don't plan on it always being sunny, 75 degrees, with, without a breeze going through uh, the Gulf. Because uh, unfortunately, and we're seeing it right now, uh, as this hurricane at the beginning of the season descends upon the Gulf, uh, there could be catastrophic consequences as a hurricane hits uh, an oil spill. And uh, finally, uh, Mr. Secretary, BP's CEO Tony Hayward has said that BP did not have the tools in its toolkit to respond to this type of disaster. What's worse, the CEOs of Exxon, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, and Shell all said that their companies would not have been able to respond any better. Uh, Mr. Secretary, would you agree that there needs to be a research program to develop 21st century oil safety and spill response technologies to ensure that if oil companies are going to drill ultra deep, then the technologies are there to make it ultra safe, and if an accident does occur, that the technologies can respond ultra fast to that spill? Congressman Markey, yes, um, I, do, I do believe that, and let me, if I may, just add a, a comment to that, and that is that. Uh, in what really has uh, become, uh, I consider to be an Apollo 13 type of uh, project that has gone on for a very long time. One of the things uh, that is going on is essentially you have uh, the most significant laboratory of learning. Uh, yes, the consequences are, 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 are dramatic and, and horrible from, from the soil spill, but there is a lot to be learned uh, from what has happened uh, with respect to the ongoing efforts at containment, what's worked, what's failed, et cetera. And so as a collective responsibility uh, of, of uh, Interior, uh, of the Congress, uh, of the industry, uh, we need to make sure that those lessons are, are being learned and then applied to the future. And your focus on oil spill response capability is indeed uh, a, a very high priority. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen, for coming today and, and answering our questions. Um, I want to get back to the moratorium. Uh, as my uh, colleague, Dr. Cassidy, calls it uh, so eloquently, a jobs moratorium, at least to us in Louisiana. Um, just to quote something out of the report um, from, uh, or actually the response by Judge Feldman to the moratorium request, it says, the report makes no effort to explicitly justify the moratorium. And I think that's really, the crux of this, it says it does not discuss any irreparable harm, which is a true uh, barrier that must be overcome in order to put that in place. And yet, as I understand it, there's attempts to put in place another moratorium. And uh, I want to ask, uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, are you, have you read or are you familiar with the letter from Governor Jindal uh, dated June 29th uh, regarding his response to a request by your department to ask for comments on the new moratorium? I have seen uh, the letter from uh, Governor Jindal. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter this uh, into the record with unanimous consent. Yes. Um, well, I'll just mention a couple of things in it. It says the state of Louisiana's priority is both to ensure that offshore drilling is conducted with utmost safety and regulatory oversight and to ensure the environment and natural resources of the state are protected. Unfortunately, your request for comments by today, which was June 29th, yesterday, on a con uh, comments by today on a concept without the ability to review and comment on a specific proposal does not comply with the department's obligation as required by 43 U.S.C. 1331 and 43 U.S.C. 1334A in particular. What he's saying, in essence, here is you're asking us to comment on this new moratorium, but you haven't given us any documentation. Um, are you willing, sir, to delay uh, putting forth this moratorium until you indeed provide those documents to the governor and allow him to comment on those? You know, Con Congressman uh, Fleming, uh, first, uh, I am uh, confident that uh, the imposition of the moratorium uh, 
was uh, a correct decision, and I respectfully uh, disagree with uh, the district court decision. And the Department of Justice and uh, Interior have taken that up on, on appeal to the Fifth Circuit. Uh, we believe the decision was correct. Uh, we also believe that um, the last uh, 70 days, uh, essentially uh, by themselves, if you will, make an Exhibit A as to why the moratorium uh, is essential. Uh, 71 days of uh, following all of the efforts to try to deal with uh, this blowout. Uh, tell us that uh, industry does not have the ability to quickly deal with this kind of blowout scenario. And so uh, until we get to the point uh, where we believe that we can have that assurance of safety, we'll continue to have our hand on the pause button. In other words, no, you, you will not delay the moratorium uh, and, and allow the governor uh, or the state of Louisiana to make those comments and input. Is that is that? Yeah, what we I'm work uh, we work closely with Governor Jindal on a number of uh, okay. on a number of different points, but right. uh, you know we're we're going to move forward and we're going to do what's right. right. Okay, I'd, I'd accept that as a no. Uh, well, just to kind of uh, hit the top points here, uh, in the first moratorium, we had eight scientific experts who disagreed and did not feel that it was appropriate to put this into place. We have a history of over 40 years, and over I think around 3,600 drilling units uh, out there in the Gulf, which have never had a problem. Uh, to this day, we still don't know what went wrong. Uh, we had uh, BP and Transocean here just the other day. They were shrugging their shoulders. They said, we don't even know what went wrong. I realize, I see the smile on your face. They probably know more than what they say they know, and I would agree with you on that. But I don't think we've actually come to an exact answer as to what happened. And then we have the letter on the comments, which our governor was not allowed to give input. And then finally, we're talking about proposing legislation here by July 14th, and we don't even know what went wrong. So isn't this, sir, really more about politics than it is about policy and certainly about science? Absolutely not, Congressman Fleming. Uh, the fact is that um, the President and uh, our administration uh, have acted to deal with what is a uh, national crisis that we are facing in, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we've not done anything based uh, on any political uh, motivation here. Uh, we have a problem, and uh, our job is to fix a problem, and uh, that's what we're about. Part of fixing the problem is uh, getting the kind of uh, legislative framework and support so that we can assure that there is uh, safety, uh, the right kinds of standards, and the right kind of enforcement uh, with respect to the outer continental shelf, which is part of the reason why I think this hearing uh, is such an important hearing to have. And I, and I will respectfully disagree that uh, I think this is more about the Rahm Emanuel, never let a crisis go to waste, uh, despite uh, what we hear from the administration and, and from you today, Mr. Secretary. Uh, the facts really don't add up to anything other than this is a, uh, in my opinion, and I think to, to many on the, the panel here, that this is more about political manipulation. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Over here. So I can see. First of all, I wanted to thank you, Secretary Salazar, for your visit the other day to Maryland as part of the the President's Great Great American Outdoors Initiative. And um, I think being on this listening tour, even as you are managing the Gulf oil spill, is critical because you're hearing from Americans all across the country as to what their perspective is going forward on offshore drilling and oil and gas development um, more broadly. And so I thank you for that. And uh, it was really a treat to have you there uh, in Annapolis. Uh, the second thing I just wanted to mention is, um, and Congressman Whitman spoke to this a little bit, but of course I'm particularly focused because of the Chesapeake Bay um, on this lease sale 220. I know that's uh, been withdrawn at this point. Um, I, I just wanted to say that going forward, you can put me in the category of those who will be pretty resistant to putting it back on the table because I think that the, uh, the sensitivity of that area off the coast of, of Virginia is critical to the health of the Chesapeake Bay and, and the potential risk there is just, is just too high. And also when you look at other areas that are going to probably be off limits because of the Department of Defense concerns and so forth, we're talking about something marginal, I think. Um, I did want to ask a couple of questions. Um, the first was, we've had plenty of testimony in a number of different committees about the flaws in the response plans that were developed by BP and the rest of the industry. 
Um, and um, I know that currently in law there is some process by which uh, these companies uh, sort of certify uh, as to the, uh, the accuracy and, and due diligence behind these plans, but it's not all that robust from what I can gather. And um, I was interested in your perspective and, and Director Bromwich's as well on um, whether you think it might be a good idea to have uh, the CEOs of these companies have to, in effect, personally certify to the uh, adequacy of these plans that they've gone through a rigorous uh, process and potentially with that personal certification bear some um, civil liability uh, if it turns out that the right kind of uh, practices were not in place and the process wasn't uh, carried forward because I think that would create uh, the right kind of behavior modification uh, within the industry if you have people at the top who are, who are responsible for this. Uh, Congressman uh, Sarbanes, uh, first, thank you for uh, your leadership uh, with uh, No Child Left Inside and uh, all the work that you're doing uh, with respect to young people and connecting them uh, to the outdoors. Uh, secondly, with respect to your uh, very important question, uh, it is something that needs to be looked at relative to how we move forward uh, with oil spill response uh, plans uh, that are, in fact, uh, workable. Um, there are there's no doubt at all that there's an oil spill response plan that is being actuated uh, uh, today as we speak in, in the Gulf of Mexico, and it's been underway um, since uh, April 20th. Um, there's also uh, no doubt uh, that it has been inadequate, and so the kinds of questions that you raise are uh, exactly the kinds of questions that we're all uh, examining as we uh, decide how we're going to move forward. And I'll turn it over to Director Bromwich uh, to amplify. I think your suggestion about requiring a certification is an interesting one. Uh, it's, it's obviously a pattern on certifications that are required by CEOs and CFOs uh, uh, required by Sarbanes-Oxley legislation. Um, I know from having been in the private sector for a number of years that that requirement for certification has focused the minds of corporate executives on their responsibilities and has forced them to engage more deeply in making sure that the information that's contained in corporate financial statements are correct. Uh, and so as a result of that experience in the corporate sector, uh, I think your proposal has to be taken very seriously. Thank you. And I've got about 40 seconds left, so let me, the second question real quick is, um, there is a pilot project in the proposed legislation that Chairman Rahal um, has developed which would look at um, the the opportunity to measure uh, more accurately and through the use of technology exactly what's coming out at the wellhead in terms of the volume of, of gas and, and oil that's, that's, um, that's emitted there. And um, I think the idea is over time to develop that as, as another source of figuring out what the, the right kind of royalty payments should be. And what I'm curious about is whether you think it's a good idea to ultimately cu cut to the chase and say that we're going we're gonna to determine the royalties by applying it uh, right against what's coming out of the wellhead because the process for determining royalties is kind of a hocus pocus one once you get further up the chain. And so I'd like to, your reaction to the proposal to actually use that volume measured at the wellhead as the basis for uh, determining royalty. Congressman Sarbanes, uh, first, uh, the whole question of royalty simplification is something which uh, we have been working on. Uh, I have not reviewed this particular language in the legislation, but we would be happy to do that and uh, to get back uh, to the Chairman and you with respect to our response on the legislation. Uh, secondly, let me say one of the things that um, we have learned in this 71-day uh, ordeal is that uh, there is a significant lack of uh, instrumentation uh, relative to uh, what is happening on the well, on the blowout preventer, and a whole host of other things. So Secretary Chu and our whole science team that we have had uh, focused on this problem has actually brought uh, much of their knowledge on instrumentation and pressure valves and a whole host of other things into this, this, this equation. So I think this will be one of the lessons learned uh, from this uh, Deepwater Horizon tragedy. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, we know you got to go. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the committee. Our next uh, question is from uh, or our next members. Kaufman from Louisiana. Oh, Colorado. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Kaufman. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Uh, Bromwich, the uh, question I had was for uh, Secretary Salazar, but I'll go ahead and address it to you. And that is that uh, because it concerns MMS, which uh, you've got a brand new uh, name for it now. Uh, but when we, uh, Secretary Salazar addressed the ethics questions, a, a number of questions that came out of, uh, I think, a September of 2008 IG report uh, that I think were well addressed by Secretary Salazar. But President Obama, in his Oval Office speech a couple weeks ago, uh, when discussing MMS said, and I quote, the pace of reform was just too slow, unquote. And what I think that he referred to uh, was the pro other problems at MMS uh, outside of the ethics issues uh, uh, that were uh, to the competency uh, and execution of their oversight uh, of offshore drilling. Now, obviously, uh, MMS has been a problem agency for a very long time. Uh, in the late 1990s, uh, someone at MMS failed to include a price threshold on uh, OCS leases, and GAO estimated this cost the U.S. taxpayers up to $14 uh, billion. Uh, even though um, uh, the work uh, done by Secretary Salazar to clean up MMS in Denver, uh, the Denver office, um, though there were still problems at, M at MMS Gulf operations. Uh, I've read press releases uh, that four monthly inspections uh, of the Deepwater Horizon uh, in this past year um, uh, were not done, uh, that permits were approved in as little as five minutes, and other indications that MMS was just not doing a good enough job. Um, how much do you think that these errors uh, contributed to the disaster, uh, particularly the, the not doing the inspections uh, on uh, Deepwater Horizon? And um, do you think that they should have been addressed more vigorously? The short answer is I don't know and I don't think we know uh, whether and to what extent the failure to do uh, comprehensive, timely inspections contributed in any way to the disaster. I think the evidence that's come before the public so far, and it is obviously fragmentary, is that there were a combination, as I think has been referred to before, of, of human and equipment errors that's the responsibility of BP. It is undoubtedly true, though, uh, that the resources of my agency that it can allocate to inspections is grossly inadequate. Uh, I believe there are 62 inspectors to uh, inspect the thousands of installations in the Gulf alone. And that is in stark contrast to the numbers uh, in other parts of the country. So there is absolutely no question that this agency has been inadequately staffed with respect to inspections, uh, and that is something that really needs to change. How about inadequate leadership? Uh, I, I was brought in uh, because of my experience in leading agencies. Uh, and I hope to make a big difference in this agency. But uh, you're not, so your view is that it's not just papered over by more money. The fact is that people weren't doing their job, that were assigned to do their job, and, and that the Secretary of the Interior was not aware uh, during the 16th month tenure that these people were not doing their job. Well, you're, you're making statements and assumptions that haven't come from me. Do so you think that the Secretary was aware that the, these inspections were not no, taking place? No, I, I, didn't, I didn't say that either. I don't know whether this was preventable uh, by timely and repeated inspections or not. And I think we will probably never know that. That is what I am saying. Well, won't and, the, and let me finish, please. Well, no. Won't the investigation look at the issue of the failure of this Department to conduct inspections and, and what the ramifications of what, that, what the, the failure uh, are, relate to this crisis? I think there are multiple investigations going on that will explore that issue. Whether anyone is ever going to be able to draw a specific cause and effect relationship between inadequate number of inspectors and inadequate inspectors. Don't you and, want and to know that? Don't you want to know whether or not the failure to conduct these inspections related to this crisis? Course, Don't you want to know? Of course. That? We all do. And you are going to find that out? I, I, I am not going to find that out, but the multiple investigations are going to find that out. That is right. Chairman, um, I yield back. Mr. Gall is recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, 
at the offset, I have a couple of questions for Mr. Brownwich. But uh, at the offset, let me say that I'm I'm a member of Congress that's very appreciative of the recommendation that Secretary Salazar made to the President uh, for the moratorium on uh, on deep on deep sea uh, drilling. Uh, I think that was prudent. It was necessary, uh, and and given what we know up to this point, the lack of uh, response capability by the company, uh, lacks oversight by the agency, uh, a coziness that has been to brought up time and time again between the agency, and this is not all new. This has been a decade of building, and uh, while the moratorium is is bringing hardship to to many. Uh, I think it is still the, the wise and prudent thing to do until we're sure that another catastrophe is not going to finish devastating that region. Uh, and uh, this has taken ten, 10 years to, to get here. Uh, and in those 10 years, you know, the, uh, all the things that we're finding out now have been building. And I think it's important to stop, pause, and reassess where we're at and where we need to be in the future. I think there's also some parallels, Mr. Chair Chairman, between offshore and onshore. And uh, the comments that were made by the Secretary about the necessity to talk to the Bureau of Land Management in terms of their permitting process, their categorical exclusion uh, process regarding NEPA, uh, their, their inspections and oversight, I think is a, an appropriate next step. Uh, the question I have, Mr. Brownwich, is, uh, in your view, what changes need to be made in the industry's behavior to improve uh, environmental and safety performance? We've been talking for the last few months about how to reorganize uh, your department and other government agents, your agency and other government agencies, how we're going to fund a cleanup, what organic legislation needs to be put together. Uh, but we've talked less about what the companies themselves can do to prevent uh, the disaster that we're dealing with. What steps uh, would you like to see taken in the short, in the medium, and in the long terms to make sure that this doesn't happen again and where that part of that responsibility is falling on industry and uh, their behavior and uh, your comments on that? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, I, I think it is necessarily a cooperative uh, relationship between the Department of the Interior and my agency specifically and the oil companies, so oil and energy companies. We will certainly welcome uh, the suggestions that they have uh, on how to enhance uh, and tighten up uh, necessary regulation. Uh, but it's, uh, it's essentially my agency's responsibility and the Interior Department's agency to take a look at the regulations that exist and make determinations as to whether they are adequate. Uh, based on what we are, what we now know, and what we are learning about the risks that uh, offshore uh, drilling uh, can create, and so we're going to be taking a very hard look at whether the existing regulatory structure uh, is adequate. We know that the resources that have been allocated to regulation and enforcement have been inadequate, and so I think it, we have to look at both, both the regulations that exist uh, and the resources allocated to regulation and enforcement. I think uh, there have been a lot of allegations and I think significant evidence that there has been too cozy a relationship between regulators uh, and, and the industry. Um, that's not going to continue. Uh, we're going to have an arm's length, tough, aggressive regulatory uh, program. It's going to be fair, it's going to be even handed, uh, but it's going to be tough. And in, the, in cases of violations of the regulations, uh, substantial sanctions will be imposed. And in the case of willful violations of the regulations, extraordinarily serious sanctions will be imposed. I, I, uh, Mr. Director, one, one other question that I've brought up a, a couple of times, that has to do with BP Atlantis and the, uh, the whistleblower who, uh, who would, who's been telling anybody that would listen that, that the rig is operating without engineer-approved safety documents. I asked for a set of documents at subcommittee hearing uh, and uh, as you grow, go forward with the reorganization, uh, a couple of questions. How are we going to deal better with those whistleblower uh, claims and concerns? And two, uh, the lingering question about BP Atlantis uh, and uh, if that has been fully and properly uh, and scientifically looked at in terms of 
uh, not having to deal with any spillage or any catastrophe there. Let me take your second question first. I don't know the exact status of the examination of the BP Atlantis matter. Uh, I've been on the job eight days, as you know, and I know that there are uh, people looking at it and resources being allocated to looking at it, but I can't give you okay. a specific account of where that stands. With respect to more generally dealing with whistleblower complaints, uh, one of the reasons I created the unit last week, the Investigations and Review Unit, is specifically to give me a SWAT-type capability to deal with allegations, including whistleblower allegations, and to run them to ground very quickly uh, determine, to determine whether there is substance behind them or not. Uh, I think that, that in my tenure as the Inspector General of the Department of Justice from 1994 to 1999, I had developed a lot of experience dealing with whistleblower allegations. I learned that certainly not all whistleblower allegations are true, uh, yep. but that they need to be taken seriously. They cannot be assumed to be false, because in fact many of the allegations that on first blush appeared to be frivolous turned out to be true, uh, and many allegations that appeared to be accurate turned out to not have evidence to support them. So whistleblowers are important. Their allegations need to be taken seriously, uh, and they need to be investigated seriously. Uh, and I am going to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from California, Mr. McClintock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Bromwich, uh, the, the President and the Secretary have spoken extensively about the need to reduce America's reliance on foreign oil and uh, also uh, after this uh, disaster uh, uh, upon the need to reduce our reliance, particularly on deep sea drilling. Uh, and yet the um, Secretary today in his, uh, in his written testimony uh, boasts of canceling the upcoming Beaufort and uh, Chokchi uh, lease sales in the Arctic, removing Bristol Bay altogether from leasing, uh, both the current five-year plan as well as the next five-year plan, removing the Pacific Coast and the Northeast entirely from any drilling under a new five-year plan. And I'm just wondering, how do we reduce our reliance on foreign oil by uh, uh, putting off limits uh, American uh, domestic supplies? I don't think anybody is putting off limits domestic supplies. I think, as the Secretary said, what seemed to be dictated by uh, the Deepwater Horizon accident was pushing the pause button, trying to figure out what happened and what, what we learned should shape um, our deepwater drilling policy. But, so but my, my understanding is that uh, a large number of entities are investigating that matter. Uh, I'm sure the Secretary and certainly I will be looking very carefully at what those investigations conclude, and that will shape, I assume, the Secretary's decisions and the Administration's policy uh, as to what to do. By pushing that pause button, though, you are making us more and more reliant on foreign oil supplies, uh, and by placing surface uh, production off limits, uh, you're making us more and more reliant on deep sea drilling. My understanding is that uh, in response to the quite unexpected and un unprecedented disaster in the Gulf, uh, that the President and the Secretary thought that the actions that they've taken were the prudent things to do. I wasn't around when those decisions were made, but that's my understanding as to what the reasons well, were. That, that judgment is open to very, very serious question. Um, let me move to the, uh, the, the disaster itself. Blowouts have occurred before. Uh, why? Place. I can't answer that question. I don't know the answer. According to published reports, there was a contingency plan that involved corralling and uh, burning the oil as it reached the surface, and that was shelved by the Department of Interior uh, as the disaster unfolded. I have no knowledge of that. We keep seeing reports of um, the, um, the Jones Act interfering with uh, uh, the uh, uh, volunteering of uh, foreign vessels for the uh, assistance in this bill. Uh, we saw a report last week of uh, oil skimmers uh, being shut down by the Coast Guard because they didn't go through a proper Coast Guard inspection for life vests. Uh, we've, of course, heard the complaints of the uh, governor of Louisiana that he cannot get um, permission uh, uh, to, to build berms to protect uh, his coast. Uh, the picture is becoming one of a tangled and dysfunctional bureaucracy tripping over itself. Uh, would you care to comment on that now that you've inherited that uh, mess? Well, my sense is that this, uh, this disaster was unexpected, unprecedented, uh, and therefore there really 
couldn't and wasn't a plan for dealing with specifically what happened. I know the government has mobilized its resources and uh, were they ready and was it a smooth and efficient operation from day one? I think the answer to that is no. I think the administration has acknowledged that the answer was no. But I think that now as we are on day 70 or 71, my impression again from listening to accounts and the development of a, of a concentrated and coordinated effort is that things uh, are vastly improved and that, uh, and that real uh, real progress is being made. Well, we keep hearing these assurances, but the Coast Guard incident occurred just a week ago. Boy. What is going to be done? Why is it that, well, let me just ask you this question. On the Jones Act itself, why is it that the administration has not waived that act so that additional resources can be brought to bear on the problem? I don't know the answer to that. You, you may have lost your answer when Secretary Salazar left. I, I really don't know the answer to that. One of the disadvantages of being a freshman. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Mr. Gett. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, I'd like to welcome you, Mr. Bromwich. I, I think you'll be happy you took this job. I hope so, because you come with great recommendations. Thank you. When Mr. Kaufman was asking you um, about the agency and, and, the, um, and the resources of the agency, one of the answers you gave about what is admittedly um, a, a very poor regulatory oversight scheme before in the MMS was that the agency needs more personnel to be able to review these applications. And as you can imagine, in, in Congress here, we hear this all the time. I mean, everybody needs more personnel. Everybody needs more resources. And uh, certainly, we can't disagree that MMS, or the, now the new regulatory scheme, will need adequate resources and personnel. Uh, but as someone who spent years overseeing the FDA, you, can, you could put unlimited resources and personnel and still not do the job. So I'm wondering if you could talk briefly about your intent of, of uh, as well as requesting new resources and personnel, trying to prioritize some of these applications and these processes. Because it's true there are many, many offshore sites. But it's also true that there are very few deep water sites, and certainly even fewer of the complexity of this site. And, and so it, it would seem that, that as you're revamping the agency, you're going to need to take those things into consideration. I'm wondering if, if you can share any initial thoughts with us. First, thank you for your kind words. Second, yes, they are only preliminary and initial thoughts. Uh, I, I think that in addition to um, getting an enhancement of resources, which I, I think there is almost universal acknowledgement that the agency needs, we needed to examine the way that the inspectors and the inspection teams have done their work. We also need to examine the way that people who were reviewing lease applications and permit applications have prioritized what they're doing. I can tell you that there will be a top to bottom review of all aspects of what my agency currently does with an eye, with an eye first to ensuring safety and environmental soundness, but also making sure that uh, drilling uh, that should go on and needs to go on does go on. What is your time frame for that review? And, and uh, I'm, I'm assuming you'll be happy to come back and talk to this committee about your findings and your plan. Absolutely. I don't have a timetable yet for it. I frankly have spent most of my time here up on the Hill uh, in front of various committees. So I literally have not been able yet even to talk to most of my staff. So I don't want to give you a, an estimate as to how long it will take. Uh, that I'm giving you totally on the fly. I, I'm assuming you're moving with all due speed, though, because of this Faster moratorium and this. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, I want to ask you a couple of specific questions. You might not yet know the answer to these questions, but um, Mr. Chairman, um, we're we're looking at this Clear Act, and it has a lot of reforms that we believe are important to to updating the regular regulatory scheme. Um, one of the areas that I specifically want to talk about is Section 229, which is online availability to the public of information relating to oil and gas chemical use. What this section does is it requires that the list of chemicals used in drilling or completing a well on BLM land 
made available online within 30 days of completion. This requirement is similar to a requirement in a bill that Representative Hinchy and I introduced on, on disclosure of components of hydraulic fracturing fluid. And so I'm very supportive of this section of the bill. I'm wondering if your agency favors disclosure of the chemicals that are used in drilling on BLM land. The short answer is I don't know. As you described the proposal, uh, it sounds intuitively like an appealing requirement whether there are whether there are reasons why it's not as good an idea as it sounds like to me, I don't know. So again, that's the best answer I can give you. Would at this you time. would you mind having someone from your agency supplement your answer so that we can get some sense as we move forward with this legislation? A I, I absolutely. Would, I'll tell you, as someone who's known Ken Salazar longer than anybody in Congress, I would assume he would support it, but, but we'll let your agency speak for itself. And, and just so you know, my inclination is to be as transparent as possible on almost everything. I just don't know whether there are reasons that I'm not w aware of that militate against it, sure. so I don't want to make a commitment that I then later have to retract. Sure. Um, Section 226 of this CLEAR Act requires the Interior Department to develop best management practices for environmentally responsible development of oil and gas on federal lands. What types of best management requirements would you consider in implementing this provision? And have you learned anything um, from the Deepwater Horizon catastrophe that will inform those best management practices? The short answer is that this, again, I'm sorry to say, is something that I've not yet had the chance to, to look at, um, but certainly uh, in other fields that I've worked in, both in government and outside of government, the paying close attention to what best management practices are and trying to formulate them uh, in a reasonable way is an important part of making things work better. I'm sure we all look forward to your next appearance so you can explain all these issues. Thank Great. you, Mr. Thank you. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Uh, General H, time has expired. Mr. Chairman. May I suggest to my colleague from Colorado that she's probably the number two person who's known the secretary the longest. And I would suggest John Salazar has known him longer. <laughs> Point well taken. The record will be corrected. The gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Cassidy, is recognized on his own time. Thank this you. This time. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Brownwich, um, you know, when the secretary says that his boot is on the neck of BP, it's the workers back home who feels like the boot is on their neck. And of course, they're the ones who are, we're not hurting Tony Hayward, we're, we're hurting the rig workers. Now, and as it turns out, it's not just the deep water rigs, it's also back home, and I know that there's a different message coming out of the department, that there's effectively a de facto moratorium on shallow water drilling. That sure, we hear that it's gonna be an easy process, and Bob Abbey came by and, came by and spoke about it, but it's not. Um, what do I have here? Uh, as of May 6th, um, I'm sorry that only two shallow water permits have been issued. They were rescinded quickly. Then some others were put out, but these are not for new rigs. There's approximately 17 shallow water rigs now idle, waiting for work that would be provided through the issuance of new drilling permits. And notably, these 17 idle rigs were all operating prior to the job moratorium. Uh, they represent more than 40, 38 percent of the available marketable rigs. Now, what is the uh, how can we kind of get a straight statement? Or let me just ask you, I don't want to put that pejoratively, and I apologize. Um, I'm hearing from back home that there's a de facto moratorium. In the member's briefing the other day, you said no not. Uh, what's the story? Well, my understanding is that there is not a de facto moratorium, that there are some additional requirements that have been imposed by the notice to lessees that have gone out within the last 30 days. My understanding is that there are specific, there, that, that completed applications that satisfy those new requirements um, have been filed, as I think, of the day before yesterday. And my understanding is that my agency is looking at those with the intention of, uh, of granting those that, uh, that merit it. So there is no de facto moratorium that, that I'm aware of. I've certainly been given uh, no instructions, Mr. Cassidy, to slow walk or stop uh, applications. Uh, and I think it's a matter of, of the companies uh, complying with the new requirements that, that have been imposed. Uh, so there is no de facto moratorium, but I think that the new requirements are what's taking the additional time. My understanding, Mr. Cassidy, I think we talked about this at the meeting uh, last Thursday, is that my agency is doing everything possible through frequent phone calls uh, with members of the affected industry to and try so to answer. Not, not to be rude, but just, and I, I accept that. So yep. ideally, in, 
And it was after that I felt reassured. And then yesterday I get this, which tells me, no, indeed, there's still a de facto moratorium. And, and what is that? Uh, this is messages from back home. Okay. Um, okay. So My understanding, again, from talking to participants on those phone calls is that they felt and believed that they had answered questions that the industry was posing to them and that people felt a lot more sure about uh, what the expectations were. So there may be a, a disconnect between what my people believe is being communicated and what may be understood. I suspect that there's not a misunderstanding on the part of people who are actually on the call and who had an opportunity to ask the questions and get their questions answered. But as the information trickles down the line, perhaps something is being lost in the translation. So we'll, we'll research it and come back to you. Yes, that, that sounds perfectly now, the, appropriate. Now, now, speaking about the CLEAR Act, there actually seems to me kind of a, a weirdness here in the sense that um, when it comes to what went wrong, uh, we have a sense from the white paper of what went wrong. Mm -hmm and what definitely can be taken place to allow OCS drilling to proceed, particularly since your agency has these plans on file. And, but we won't proceed with that, even though we have a definite white paper with specific recommendations, et cetera. On the other hand, the CLEAR Act, which we haven't yet had the commission, and there's all these uncertainties regarding what really went wrong from other aspects, for example, the response, we're going to proceed with without hearing the commission. Now, there seems to be a kind of oddness about that. We don't proceed where we have definite answers, but we proceed before we have answers on those other areas where we have no answers. Your thoughts on that? Well, uh, again, my eighth day on the job, I haven't read the CLEAR Act. I don't know what the specific requirements are that are contemplated uh, in the CLEAR Act, so I really can't speak to the disconnect you're sensing. I'm, I, I'm happy to come back later on when I'm better informed on the uh, specific uh, provisions in the CLEAR Act, but I'm really not able to help you today. Uh, that, that's fairness. Oh, that's a fair, that's a fair, fair question. Um, before I go into another, I'm almost out of time. In deference to colleagues, I'll, re I'll yield back. Thank you. A uh, gentleman from Washington, Mr. Inslee. Thank you. Uh, it seems to me as we go forward to try to prevent another tragedy like this, uh, we ought to take a look at how we do a regulatory system in aviation. And in my evaluation of this industry, this appears to be wildly below the safety standards of the aviation industry, in large part because of our FAA regulatory system. <coughs> in the aviation context, the way it works is the FAA essentially establishes a standard of performance that you will not have, for instance, uh, a loss of hydraulic system that controls your, your control surfaces more than one in a billion takeoffs or some, some number. It establishes a statistical expectation for the industry to meet. It then requires the industry to provide engineering data to show that every particular critical system will meet that statistical expectation. And then it's rig rigorously evaluated. It seems to me that that's a template that we ought to consider following in this industry. Um, an alternative way is to provide specific item by item requirements as to each particular process. Or maybe we do both. I guess the question is, as we go forward, should we create an expectation of a statistical performance level for every critical part of this process and then expect the industry to provide engineering data that, they, that their systems will meet that? It seems to me that's a, system, a systematic way of going about this that makes sense. What are your thoughts about that kind of approach? I am not nearly as familiar as you are with the standards uh, in the aviation industry or the particular regulatory scheme that's been established by uh, the FAA. I think the truth is that, that the regulation in this field, uh, that is the oil and gas field and the offshore in particular, has a lot to learn from a lot of places. And so as we craft what will be a newly revamped and reformed regulatory regime, I think and hope that we're going to be looking at a wide variety of regulatory schemes, uh, kind of best practices, if you will, and see how relevant and analogous they are to what we need to impose. And I, so I hope we take what's good from column A, what's good from column B, and what's good from column C, and therefore create a sort of a best of class, best of breed regulatory scheme. So I'm very interested in the aspects of the FAA regulatory scheme that you're describing. I'm not knowledgeable yet enough to, ha to have an opinion as to how much of that is graftable on 
uh, the oil and gas regulation that I'm going to be responsible for, but I'm interested in talking about that with you further. Well, I'd like to do that. Uh, for instance, the blowout preventer, highly technical, sophisticated piece of equipment that has some analogy to aircraft, and, and I think we do need to establish performance standards that are several orders of magnitude higher than we have right now. You know, for instance, we found in our investigation that as many as 50 percent of these things failed under actual conditions, which you don't, nobody gets on an airplane if 50 percent of them crash. Uh, so I'll look forward to working with you. I'll be proposing some amendments in that regard. Terrific. Second thing we think we ought to have is an expectation that the industry uses best available technology, that that is also an expectation in the industry that will have the best available technology, in fact, will be used. What are your thoughts about that performance standard? Uh, again, it, intuitively it sounds sensible to me. It's, it's uh, a little bit puzzling why an industry would use anything other than that. I know that cost considerations are loom large. Uh, I, I understand that these companies are properly uh, out to make a profit, but they certainly shouldn't and can't do that uh, at the expense of taking the necessary precautions. Well, unfortunately, I think that has been the case just with one thing we have come across, for instance, having a remote acoustically activated device that would activate the blowout preventer if the, if the communications was lost with the drill rig. It is used in other countries, not here. It is the best available technology. I think we want to move forward. Can you, by the way, just we have found several sort of red lights that BP ran through consciously a decision not to do a cement log test to prevent, to find out if you had a problem with gas escape, a decision to go with six centralizers rather than 21 as the analysis called for, a decision to use the, the long string rather than a liner, all of which created increased risks of failure. Were, were any or all of those signed off by MM, MMS? Do you know yet I know, I whether that happened? I don't know the answer to that. I'm confident that in the multiple investigations that are being conducted, those specific questions are in the process of being answered. Thank you. I look forward to working with you. Me too. Thank you. I thank the gentleman from uh, Washington. And now I'd like to recognize myself. I have a few questions for. Uh, pardon? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I'd like to recognize the gentlelady from Wyoming. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Bromwich, uh, you're the head of the Bureau of Ocean Energy. What experience do you have in ocean energy, wh whether it's oil and gas or wave energy or wind energy? Or I, I don't have any experience in ocean energy. Uh, I do have some experience in the energy sector. I represented a number of uh, energy clients uh, on non-ocean related matters. Uh, during my last 10 plus years of, of law practice, but I have no specific expertise uh, on ocean energy. I would point out that one of the things I did as a lawyer was to gain expertise on, on matters that I previously knew nothing about. We did a two year long investigation of the Houston Police Department Crime Lab, which was one of the most, if not the most extensive forensic science investigation ever done. Uh, I don't know much forensic science, but I recruited a crack team of forensic scientists who were uh, the best in the business. And as a result of working with, that, with them, I learned a tremendous amount about it and put out a lengthy, nearly 300-page report in the summer of 2007 that's been widely acclaimed as, as one of the best examinations of a forensic lab ever done. So I don't think that a lack of experience, specifically with ocean energy, disables me from learning about it from people who do have the technical expertise and learning enough of the technical issues to be able to do, do my job appropriately. Thank you. I, I, um, I now have some questions about the, the draft bill in front of me. And as Secretary Salazar said, we are dealing with a national crisis in the Gulf of Mexico, and you have called it an unprecedented disaster. So I am curious why this bill uh, deals with changing BLM's uh, permitting and leasing authority. Director Bob Abbey of the BLM was in here and told this committee when he testified that he did not believe it was a wise idea to remove leasing and permitting authority from the BLM. So I'm curious about why a draft that's intended to deal with the national crisis in the Gulf of Mexico 
um, includes that provision. I'm further curious about why a bill that's supposed to deal with a national crisis in the Gulf of Mexico changes the requirements for issuing oil and gas on BLM and Forest Service land. So it would require the issuance in areas where energy development would not conflict with other land uses. You know, by its very nature, the multiple use con that is articulated in FLIPMA and the National Forest Management Act requires a matter of resolving inevitable conflicts. So I find that curious. I also find it interesting that this bill that's supposed to be dealing with a national crisis in the Gulf of Mexico changes onshore lease sales from a sealed bid process to uh, excuse me, changes onshore lease sales to a sealed bid, uh, bid process, removing the ability to use live auction bids. Interestingly, you did away with the Royalty and Kind program, which used a sealed bid process, whereas onshore used a live auction. And now you're taking the, the bid process that was used in Royalty and Kind and applying it to the onshore in a bill that's supposed to deal with the national crisis in the Gulf of Mexico. Fascinating. Another thing uh, in a bill that's supposed to deal with the national crisis in the Gulf of Mexico changes provisions to the Federal Oil and Gas Royalty Simplification and Fairness Act, uh, taking out um, the negotiations which occurred in the 1990s between industry and uh, the federal agencies under the Clinton administration, and at that time the states, uh, which I was involved with, um, and takes away the provisions that uh, were intended to uh, work with industry, protecting the agency uh, from having to meet deadlines, uh, removing provisions where industry has to meet deadlines, and all along uh, that bill, which was a delicate balance between industry, the states, and the federal government, just completely threw the states under the bus at the time it was enacted. So um, I'm looking at this bill and saying this is supposed to deal with a national crisis in the Gulf of Mexico. Most of this bill has absolutely nothing to do with the national crisis in the Gulf of Mexico. And so I'm disappointed, I would just say, that we're not using the culmination of these hearings, which are focused on the national disaster in the Gulf of Mexico, to craft legislation to deal with the national disaster in the Gulf of Mexico. We're using this legislation to deal with uh, many, many other subjects that require much more uh, discussion and vetting uh, than is going to occur within the national crisis in the Gulf of Mexico when that, I believe, is where our, our attention should lie. And Madam Chairman, my time is up. I thank the gentlelady from Wyoming and now I'd like to recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Costa. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairwoman. I've got a couple of questions kind of in the, in the weeds and I know you've been there eight days, so whether or not... Not, not eight full days yet. Oh, seven and a half. Seven and a half days. All right. right. Very good. Well, we'll see how we do. <laughs> and then I'd like to ask some broader general questions. Sure. Um, in the technical area, uh, in this legislation, uh, Mr. Director, uh, Section 222 of the bill requires biannual reports from the lessees to address the steps taken for a diligent developed lease. Uh, this means that lessees would have to compile at least eight reports, as I understand it, during a lease term. If they don't develop a lease within that term, they'd have to relinquish the lease anyway. Um, do you think this extra paperwork is necessary? Um, and do you suspect there's a better way of trying to address this uh, for the holders of these federal uh, leases? The answer is I don't know whether it's necessary. Uh, I don't know what the view is. Will you are. take a review of that as sure. we're looking at this and get back to us? Absolutely. Uh, another section, 221 of the CLEAR Act, requires you to define and establish the diligent development benchmarks for oil and gas leases. Um, again, you're not expert, uh, an expert in this area. You've already uh, 
submitted that. Uh, but I think we know that finding and developing the appropriate energy sources is not a standardized process, whether we're talking about shallow or deep water. I'm wondering how the, your uh, new uh, rearranged agency is going to deal with the topography, the reservoir characteristics, and comp composition of, of these resources, as well as the environmental uh, considerations, market conditions, and economic factors will, that would define the benchmarks. I mean, when you find a carbon footprint, having been out there, uh, in, as, and I chair the subcommittee, so we're going to be talking some more and we'll see more of you. Uh, but I've also been to the Middle East, and like there's an 8 in 10 chance you put a hole in the ground in Iraq and you, you're going to have a significant fine. It's about 40 percent in the Gulf. So developing where a significant carbon fine is, whether it be oil or gas, is not a slam dunk, to say the least. So I'm just wondering how this is going to work under Section 221. I, I can't give you a detailed answer to that. I look forward to working with you. Will you get back to you. me on that as yes. well? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about more like 50,000 feet up. Okay. Maybe you can respond to these. Sure. Uh, do you think that the use of shallow and deep water, uh, the use of, 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 of oil and gas in shallow and deep water sources uh, will continue to be a part of our nation's energy portfolio in the foreseeable future? My understanding is that it will, yes. Yeah, I mean, I don't see any way out of it in the next 10 or 20 I don't think anybody does, Congressman. Okay. So obviously your role in part is to ensure that we can do it as safely as possible. That's right? exactly right. Um, then how do you plan to uh, use this situation as a, an opportunity to restore confidence by the American public that in fact we can do this safely? Well, I think one of the advantages of having so many investigations of what went wrong with the Deepwater Horizon is that we will have a wealth of information uh, accumulating over the next uh, few months as to what the specific issues were uh, that caused the blowout and caused the extraordinary and devastating spill that, that is now being dealt with. Uh, I think that, that once that evidence has been accumulated, it's analyzed, it's synthesized, um, that needs to be presented to the American people in an understandable way so that that can generate the confidence that the drilling that will continue in the future both in shallow water and deep water, uh, will be done in an environmentally safe and sound manner. Technical question again, and you said you did comment that uh, when you look at the personnel available with minerals and management services today to go out there and do the appropriate um, um, determination as to whether or not uh, the, even the existing regulations are being followed as willfully and inadequate. Are, have you taken upon yourself to begin to make an evaluation as to what you're going to need? to have the necessary personnel to... Oh, yes, absolutely. In fact, there's a lot of good work that's already gone on in the department. How much are you going to need to... to uh, I, I think it's a very substantial number. Again, the, the department is still working through those have numbers. Have you done a comparative analysis between the Secretary's proposal, again, I know you're new, uh, for the reorganization and the proposal that we're looking at in this legislation? I don't have that kind of comparison. Of, uh, and, but I'd like you to be able to sit down and do that and get back to us, and then we may use that as a means for a subcommittee hearing uh, to do that comparative analysis or at least have that conversation. Very good. All right. My time's expired. Thank you. Madam Thank you very much, and, uh, We'll look forward to having some more conversations, and I wish you uh, uh, good luck. And, uh, Terrific. And obviously our nation's uh, long-term success in terms of all the energy tools that are in our energy toolbox depend upon the job that you do. So we look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you. I thank the gentleman from uh, Texas, or California, I'm sorry, California, uh, Mr. Costa, and now I'd like to recognize the acting ranking member, Mr. Gomert, from Texas. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate y'all your uh, patience, uh, Mr. Bromwich. And, uh, Obviously, what's going on right now are votes. We've already been had this hearing interrupted once with votes, and in that we recognize the importance of special education teachers, named a post office, recognized a California city's 100th anniversary, and named a VA outpatient clinic. And right now we're voting on the previous question and rule. My vote won't have an effect in those, and so I prefer to stay here and finish so that uh, you wouldn't have to sit through yet another hour. Thank you. I appreciate that. 
uh, and I appreciate uh, our chair's indulgence in doing that. And it's obviously pretty tough to be on the job for eight days and then come get a grilling over what's going on uh, in an event that people on both sides of the aisle are very upset about. Right. Uh, and I recognize that. And I, it says a lot about you that you're willing to come in here and, and deal with that. Thank and you. I appreciate it. Um, I, I'd hope to um, ask the secretary about his comments directly. Uh, since he had had to leave, all I can do is comment and get the takeaway from it. But uh, in response to Mr. Markey, Secretary Salazar basically indicated the state should deploy all the National Guard troops they need, that he was surprised the states have not moved forward with uh, deploying troops and doing what they need. Now, in uh, hearing from uh, my former classmate here in Congress, Bobby Jindal, uh, it, it, they felt so frustrated because they've had to get permission from people to do all the different things they're doing. And it seemed like, um, the, I th know there's one time when they just moved ahead and then got permission as they were about to start anyway. But it sounds like since the Secretary is surprised that the states have not moved forward with what they need, that the, the wonderful takeaway from the hearing today based on the Secretary's statements is that uh, Governor Jindal and other governors just need to do what they need. They have full authorization to do that. They don't have to worry about getting government approval. Uh, and that way, in the future, they can avoid having the Secretary of Interior be surprised that they didn't move forward with what they need. They just need to go ahead and do it and not ask permission from another federal authority, not the Coast Guard, not the Interior, not FEMA, not anybody else is being sent down there to stand in the way of what they need to do. They just need to do it, and that way the secretary won't have to be surprised that the states haven't done what they need to do. And I, I couldn't believe he would sit here and say that. With all the things that have not been done with regard to the inspections, and I know as you get into this, I'm going to be anxious to hear uh, your take on what all has occurred and not occurred, but we had Director Birnbaum in here when she was still director, and I'd asked about the offshore inspectors. Now, you're coming into this, and I'm telling you, having heard the testimony, I'm telling you, something's got to be done. You got unionized offshore inspectors, and she told us that the check and balance was to send a pair together. That way they can watch each other. They can report on what the other is doing and not doing. And, and that way we'll make sure both of them are really doing their job because they know the other's watching over their shoulder. When I asked her, wouldn't it have been a good idea if the last unionized pair that went out to the Deepwater Horizon rig had not been a father and son team? Uh, she indicated it was under investigation. She really couldn't comment. I'm telling you, she was not willing to say this, but we should not have father and son teams going out there. That whole system has got to be changed. And if there's restrictions on travel or hours they can work, it's got to be done. I do want to ask, though, how long was the moratorium, or maybe it's still going on, for coal mining in West Virginia uh, after the 29 miners were killed? Is that I, still I don't, in place? I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Was there ever a moratorium? I don't know the answer to that. Well, I can tell you there was not one, and I'd like to know why not. If we have to have a moratorium, not just on the unsafe practices British Petroleum may have had, and that may be going on on some of their rigs, because we know they have a dismal safety record compared to other companies, but then also take out their competitors with a moratorium, then why would there be no moratorium when 29 coal miners are killed? That makes no sense at all. And also, because of your experience and all, uh, the secretary said he believed the moratorium on drilling was correct. As you know from your background, it's not enough to believe something. 
you got to have evidence. And the court was shocked that there was not evidence, that, that it was clearly arbitrary and capricious based on the lack of evidence. And so please, now that you're in place with your background, you can help them understand you don't do things based on beliefs, you do them based on evidence. And I think you can have a profound effect in that, in that regard. Well, thank you. you. And, and just, to, just to respond briefly to, to one of your points, uh, as you know, the Department and the Department of Justice are appealing the judge's decision. I know that. They announced uh, they, they, that before they, they, they even read the opinion. They, that would have been a good idea. Well, I'm not sure that's They true. said that. Okay. Uh, but, but I know that they believe the judge's decision was wrong, and that's why they moved for a stay and uh, a, an expedited appeal to the Fifth Circuit. Some of the worst decisions that are, are votes in this Congress have been when people did not read the bills, and so I'd recommend the uh, DOJ do the same thing before they decide to appeal. But anyway, I would appreciate uh, your looking into these matters. These are really serious matters. You're walking in to a firestorm. I recognize that. I appreciate your willingness to do that. But we're going to have to get some answers, and I hope you'll be able to get them sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman. I thank the uh, gentleman from uh, Texas, uh, Mr. Gohmert, and uh, welcome to the uh, hearing. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Bromwich, I understand you've been in the job eight days, and uh, you've been to several hearings. Is that correct? That's correct. This is my well, third. Well, you're a brave soul. Thank you. Uh, I have a few questions to ask. Um, last week, you testified before the Senate Energy Committee that you needed to study the proposed reorganization so you could make a recommendation about it. Now, does this mean that splitting up MMS into three agencies, as you announced in the secretarial order, is, is that not set in stone? Do you believe that this is a, a good thing? Th thank you very much for your question. Uh, when I was asked to take this job, I was informed that there was a proposal that had already been made to divide the then existing MMS into three different pieces. Uh, Secretary Salazar said he thought it was fair and appropriate that I have the ability to understand the reorganization proposal and make any modifications that I thought were appropriate based on my uh, learning more about it and getting comfortable with it. Although I've been, this is my third hearing and there have been a lot of uh, other things I needed to do, I've had further conversations uh, both with the Secretary and with people who have spent a good amount of time uh, dealing with this issue, studying the issue, dealing with uh, employees in my organization to get their views on things. Uh, and, and I am far more comfortable today than I, on day eight than I was on day one, uh, that that is the right path forward. So you are looking to the three split, three ways. I think that based on what I know, that makes uh, uh, quite a bit of sense. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Brumwich, I understand that there are some additional subsea tests that are being conducted on the blowout preventers being used on the relief wells, and that such testing was previously thought to not be possible. Could you describe in more detail what type of tests are being run? I wish I could, but I can't. I don't know the specifics of what kind of subsea tests are, are currently being conducted. Oh, all right. I, uh, I think, as I said before, there are multiple investigations ongoing. Uh, I have not had time, frankly, to find out where the different investigations are. There's one that's being jointly conducted by my agency and the Coast Guard. Uh, the next set of public hearings are scheduled for the week of July 19th. I plan to go down there for at least part of that as part of the process. Uh, in which I learn more about the specific issues that are being explored uh, in that investigation. That's fair enough. Thank you. And uh, my last question, do you believe that a training academy for inspectors, such as is proposed in Mr. Rahal's draft, would be a good idea? And do you think there would be any efficiencies in having a combined onshore and offshore inspection force? It, it's, a, it's a very intriguing idea. Uh, one of the things that I've already begun to focus on is how we get an experienced, uh, competent, capable cohort of inspectors, not father and son teams, but <laughs> teams of inspectors who uh, know what they're doing, that gain experience in what they're doing, and yet don't suffer from the kind of coziness with industry that my agency has been so criticized for. So we're exploring that. One of the things I want to explore is a program to recruit uh, talented petroleum engineering students straight out of school, mm -hmm. pair them with senior 
inspectors, the best that I've got, and bring along a whole new generation of uh, inspectors who are devoted to public service uh, and are not looking around the corner for a job with industry two or four or six years down the road. I think we have to find a way to establish uh, the independence Continuity. of the inspectors uh, and make sure that their commitment is to the public interest, to safety, to the protection of the environment, and that they're not looking around the corner uh, at the oil company uh, that's going to pay their salary three years down the road. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank you and uh, be sure you uh, uh, thank the, uh, the uh, Secretary, uh, Mr. Salazar. I know he had to leave. And thank you for your time today. You will be, uh, yes? Surely. Uh, the ranking member, go ahead. Yes. Uh, would just uh, like to make a request for an answer in writing. Um, our, our time on the hearing is about to conclude. But we'd had a hearing in here a few years or so ago uh, where Inspector General Devaney had in, investigated the 1998-1999 offshore leases from which the price adjustment, uh, adjustment language was intentionally pulled. The which language? I'm sorry. Uh, sir. Price adjustment language dealing with the price of oil mm -hmm. was pulled for those two years. And he had indicated in here, because obviously when something happens that costs us hundreds of millions or billions of dollars to the Treasury, uh, I don't care what party anybody's in, we ought to want to get to the bottom of it. And anyway, he had indicated that there were uh, at least two or three people that he had not interviewed because they had left government service. One of those, the, uh, one person uh, that was not interviewed apparently was uh, even involved in signing the notices for these leases and whatnot, and it turned out she went to work for British Petroleum for eight years and came off that employment last June when uh, the press release from Secretary Salazar indicates she went back to work for minerals management. I'm not sure in the, uh, the breakup where Sylvia Baca will be working, but I think it would be interesting to know if her responsibilities involve anything at all. And now that she is back in government service, if the uh, IG's office would be alerted that somebody they may not have interviewed before about what cost this country so much money um, might be interviewed by the IG now uh, to determine more answers than we were able to get or that the IG was able to get previously. Mm -hmm. So just to find out where all that sits, has the IG been alerted that she's back? And so we can find out what job she had. Does it involve BP and that kind of thing? But I appreciate My understanding, that. Congressman, is that she's recused from any and all BP matters. Yes, we were told that uh, previously. But um, what one person thinks is any and all matters may not be to all appropriate Fair matters enough. to somebody else. But I've heard recused from matters before that might be a conflict. And uh, I'd really... Uh, like to know exactly what those are. Thank you. Thank you. I thank the gentleman and uh, also uh, Director Brumwich. Uh, you were asked many questions today which you were not able to answer, so I'm sure that uh, uh, you'll be able to supply the committee with the answers to these questions and the record uh, will be, uh, of this hearing will be held open for 10 days. Is that correct? Yes. And. Um, the committee will now recess until the end of these votes. I think there are three votes down on the floor. We're going into the second one. So it'll probably be about 15 minutes before we uh, introduce the uh, second panel. And I thank you again, Director Brumwich, for being with us this morning. Thank you very much. And now the subcommittee stands in recess. The full committee of the natural resources will now come to order and we welcome the second panel of uh, witnesses. I'd like to welcome uh, Ms. Janice Cyrils Jones, Vice President for National Conservation Policy and Legal Affairs, Ocean Conservancy. 
and Dr. David E. Dismukes, PhD, Associate Executive Director and Director of Policy Analysis, Center for Energy Studies, Louisiana State University. I welcome you both, and we'll begin with you, uh, Ms. Jones. Thank you, Congresswoman Bordayo. Uh, Chairman Rahal, Ranking Member Hastings, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to participate in today's hearing. My name is Janice Jones. I am the Vice President of Programs for Ocean Conservancy, a national conservation organization that has promoted healthy and diverse ocean ecosystems since 1972. I have worked on marine issues for almost 15 years, and I serve as an adjunct faculty member of the Northwestern School of Lewis and Clark, Northwestern School of Law at Lewis and Clark College. The oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico is a human and environmental tragedy. Lives have been lost, livelihoods have been destroyed, and the region is being subjected to what the President has called the worst environmental disaster America has ever faced. We may never be able to calculate the full economic and ecological impact of the BP Deepwater Horizon spill. We do know that in the Gulf region alone, fishing and coastal tourism provide $14.5 billion annually in wages and income impacts and support over 820,000 jobs. And we know that our current OCS policy has been both an economic and environmental failure. As this committee recognized long before the current tragedy, there is an urgent need for reform of our outer continental shelf regime, and the time for action is now. The discussion draft under consideration today represents a significant step forward. The CLEAR Act addresses five key challenges facing our nation. First, our national policy for the OCS is inadequate, and we lack meaningful standards to protect the environment and ocean and coastal economies. The amendments contained in the discussion draft would begin to balance an OCS policy that is focused far too much on oil and gas development and far too little on the consequences of such development. The standard against which we must measure decisions about whether, and if so under what conditions, to permit OCS development must be one that protects the health of marine ecosystems. We believe the discussion draft should be improved to reflect that standard. Second, the process for planning and implementing OCS oil and gas activities is badly broken. The amendments contained in the discussion draft would begin to address a process that has been implemented to shield full and fair consideration of the risks and consequences of OCS development. OCS planning, exploration, and development must be subjected to meaningful environmental analysis, which requires baseline information, appropriate geographic scales of analysis, and must involve expert agencies other than the MMS or its successors. The discussion draft takes some great strides in that direction, such as requiring consultation with NOAA, but could be further strengthened. Third, as the BP Deepwater Horizon disaster continues to painfully demonstrate, there are insufficient standards for oil spill prevention and response. The discussion draft proposes significant improvements, including more rigorous safety and technology standards and more robust spill response plans. We support the amendments and suggest further strengthening the provisions by requiring consideration of the availability of oil spill response infrastructure at the five-year plan level and by conditioning the issuance of exploration permits on a real-world demonstration of response capability. Fourth, despite the importance of coastal and marine ecosystems and the risks posed by oil and gas activities, there is no dedicated funding for ocean, coastal, and Great Lakes conservation and management. The discussion drafts creation of a new Ocean Resources Conservation and Assistance Fund is an action that is long overdue and one that we strongly support. Finally, as every commission that has examined ocean policy since the late 60s has concluded, a single sector approach to ocean governance is fundamentally flawed and has led to conflicts among users and the degradation of marine ecosystems. The existing oil and gas planning process is a stark example of why we must move to a system of multi-objective regional planning for the conservation and management of marine resources. The discussion draft moves in the right direction and should be broadened to address multiple objectives, not just energy activities. Offshore drilling for oil and gas, to the extent it is to continue in the wake of the disaster in the Gulf, must be considered only as a bridge to a clean energy future. It cannot continue under a system that fails to protect the ocean and coastal economies and ecosystems upon which we all rely. The need for reform is urgent. 
I thank the committee for seeking to address that need and for the opportunity to testify. I thank you very much for your testimony, uh, Ms. Jones. And now I'd like to recognize Mr. Dismooks. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chairperson uh, and committee members. It's uh, an honor to be here this afternoon. Uh, my name is David Dismukes. I'm a professor and the Associate Executive Director for the Center for Energy Studies at the Louisiana State University. Uh, the Center for Energy Studies was created by the Louisiana Leg Legislature in 1982, and our purpose is to examine energy-related uh, research that impacts our citizens, our environment, and our economy. Uh, there are a number of positive provisions that are included in the bill that's before you this afternoon uh, that I think will go a long way in helping uh, improve offshore energy regulation. Uh, some of those include the, the, um, the, the breakup of the Minerals Management Service into separate regulatory and governance structures that will look at planning and at revenue collection and enforcement uh, separately. Uh, some of the other positive aspects of the bill include the professional resources that will be dedicated to the Minerals Management Service and the, I mean, to their successor agencies and the ability to go in and to seek out the best talent to go in and examine uh, pressing issues in energy uh, regulation as well as uh, in safety and environmental performance. Uh, the increased standards associated with reporting are also going to be, a, I, think, I think, a positive aspect associated with improved regulation for the offshore areas as well as the benchmarks that were talked about at length earlier in the hearing that I think create a unique opportunity in offshore regulation on a foregoing basis. Uh, I think Congress is missing an opportunity there, though, without changing those and maybe enhancing those a little bit by setting rewards and uh, penalties to meeting those benchmark targets. Uh, by giving profit incentives for performing in best of class or in exceeding those classes and by invoking symmetrical pen penalties for not meeting those standards, I think you'll go a long way in encouraging the types of research and development that you're thinking about in this particular uh, provision of, these, of this legislation for mitigating still, uh, spills and improving technology and oil and gas activities. However, despite a lot of those good provisions that are in the bill, there are a number of deficiencies, particularly as they relate to Louisiana. Uh, the first and one of the more important ones have to do with the provisions that would remove the current incentive programs for deep gas drilling in the shallow waters of the Gulf of Mexico, as well as the provisions that would remove the incentive program for the deep water Gulf of Mexico itself. Those provi provisions are essentially job killers for a lot of people along the Gulf of Mexico. There's 250,000 people in the Gulf states that make their living just directly in either exploration, production, or services for the oil and gas business along the Gulf states. There's 100,000 of those that live and work in the coastal counties and parishes of the Gulf of Mexico alone. And many of those are engaged in these deep water activities as well as some of these emerging activities with deep gas. Removing those incentives will make the Gulf a, a much less attractive place than it has been over the last 10 to 15 years and will discourage job creation in that area. Another deficiency that's in the bill is uh, an opportunity to address a long-standing inequity associated with the mineral revenue uh, process uh, between the states and the federal government, and that is the opportunities of sharing revenues with the coastal states that are impacted by these activities. Uh, the provisions that are in this bill that would share 10 percent among a wide range of coastal states, regardless of their participation in energy production right now, is one that is, is somewhat difficult. Uh, Louisiana, as well as its other uh, coastal states, have made big contributions in terms of supporting existing as well as current and future energy production and certainly accelerating uh, those energy uh, uh, revenue sharing provisions that were in earlier legislation is an opportunity that could be included in this bill as well. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity of speaking before you this afternoon and I look forward to the questions that you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dismooks. And now we'll uh go forward with questions. Uh, first, I ask unanimous consent to submit for the record uh, statements by Kevin Costner, the Pew Environment Group, and the Nature Conservancy. Uh, hearing no objection from the committee, so ordered. I'd like to begin with you, Ms. Jones. I'll have a few questions here. Do you buy the argument that this bill would be a job killer, or do you think it establishes a balance between various resource-dependent industries, including oil and gas, fishing, and tourism? I think that continuing to do OCS exploration unsafely is the job killer. When you look at the number of jobs that are supported by having a healthy ecosystem, a healthy marine resource, commercial fishing, recreational fishing, tourism and tourism-related jobs, it is a substantial number of jobs. We recognize that there are oil and gas jobs that are affected as well, but this is not just about oil and gas jobs. 
That's not just about oil and gas exploration. It's about how we actually manage our ocean resources responsibly and how we make sure that the marine resource is healthy enough to support all of our coastal economies. Uh, do you think the discussion draft adequately separates the planning, the leasing, and inspection functions in MMS? And does it address conflict of interest issues uh, sufficiently? There is no question that MMS is a broken agency. Uh, it's been demonstrated quite uh, adequately that it has been captured by the agency that it's supposed to regulate. The separation in the discussion draft I think is very useful, separating leasing in particular from the environmental analysis. Um, from the revenue connect, correct, uh, collection is particularly important. I do think in addition to that, there is a critical need to inject a broader view and a broader consideration in making these OCS decisions because they affect, as so vividly demonstrated by the disaster, not just oil and gas, but other marine resources. Uh, I think one of the positive things in the bill as well is to include NOAA, for example, as our nation's oceans agency and give them a more critical role uh, in expressing their views about OCS decisions. Ultimately, the most important thing, however, is to make sure that the standard for pursuing OCS development is one that is protective of marine health. Okay. It's our view that it is uh, more important to change the nature of the job than it is to restructure the agency, but we do think the discussion, the discussion draft provisions are helpful. Uh, f following up on uh, your mention of NOAA, can you explain further what current expertise NOAA offers that should be indi included in the planning and the leasing process? NOAA has the ability to do some of the widespread surveys that are needed to more fully develop our understanding and develop some baseline uh, information that's lacking in the marine context. It is the agency where most of the marine resource experts are housed. Fish and Wildlife Service also has expertise as does EPA and the Coast Guard. Um, NOAA stands out, but we would also support the inclusion of some of those other resource agencies, making sure that as uh, Mineral Management Services successor makes these OCS decisions, again, that is a broader set of considerations, not just about oil and gas development, but about the effect of that development on the environment and the effect on our coastal economies as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Jones. And uh, Dr. Dismooks, I have a couple of questions for you. You are obviously very concerned about the fact that the bill would repeal the Deepwater Royalty Relief provisions from the Energy Policy Act. But I would like you to address a few facts. There have been over 2,600 deep water leases issued since these royalty relief provisions came into effect. Companies bid over $9 billion for these leases and the number of those leases that would have royalty-free oil today, zero. Because all of these leases have clauses that say that if the price of oil is greater than about $40 a barrel, there will be no royalty relief. In 2008, companies bid roughly $4 billion for nearly 700 deep water leases while oil was approaching $150 a barrel. I believe that it defies common sense to argue that any of those companies in 2008 or any of them today expect oil to go below $40 a barrel. So how is it credible to say that repealing this provision would result in massive job losses and compromise national energy security? Well, for uh, I think a variety of reasons. Uh, the provisions that are included in the Deepwater Royalty Relief Act provide a, an addition of floor for operators that want to develop these particular areas in case those prices do wind up falling. Um, they provide security and an, a sound uh, investment environment for them in the Gulf of Mexico. And if you look at one of the reasons why operators have returned to the Gulf, uh, a lot of it has to do with the regulatory certainty and stability that has been, been created historically over the last 10 to 15 years from provisions and uh, like the Deepwater Royalty Relief Act. So I, I would disagree that the, the legislation has not had a profound impact on the industry. Over 21 percent of our domestic crude oil supplies come from deep water activities and from deep water production. Most of that occurred after 1995 when the deep water legislation was passed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Despooks. And now we have a um, member, Mr. Cassidy from Louisiana. As of you. Dr. Despooks, um, again, I feel like I'm channeling folks from back home when I point out that when the Secretary says that his foot is on the neck of BP, they actually feel as if it's 
on the neck of the roustabouts, the rig workers, the, 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 you know where I'm going with that. Yes, sir. Uh, just can you discuss uh, if this, and, and one thing you just said is that there is a great need for certainty when it comes to drilling. Yes, sir. An atmosphere of uncertainty creates caution. Caution inhibits investment. Fair statement? Yes, sir. That's correct. So can you comment upon uh, the economic impact of this job moratorium, if I may put it that way, the way folks back home describe it, upon the number of workers, the average wage per worker, those jobs relative to jobs in other fields, et cetera? Well, the oil and gas industry pays an above average wage in, in South Louisiana, as you well know, and it's a significant employer within the state as well as along other communities in the Gulf Coast. Uh, the current moratoria has uh, the potential of being very devastating on the deep water side as well as some of the activities that you commented on earlier about decreases in shallow water activity that we're starting to hear uh, stories and information about. Uh, there, as I mentioned before, about 100,000 people just in the coastal parishes alone, uh, in the coastal parishes and counties along the Gulf of Mexico that are dedicated to the, just the direct jobs associated with oil and gas activity, not those multiplier jobs that I'm talking about, but directly in exploration, directly in production, and directly in, in, in services. And if we look over the next six months, just for the moratoria alone, you're looking at probably in the near term as much as 3,000 jobs lost, uh, increasing to as much as 6,000 uh, by the time we approach the end of the moratorium up to a maximum of close to 10,000 jobs, if not more. And that's really based on our forecast at the current price levels of where crude oil is. Uh, if those prices were to increase and oil and gas activity, that would be foregone oil, oil and gas activity that we would be taking advantage of that we could not because of those increases in price. So certainly there are additional opportunities there. Some of the conventional wisdom is that we may not make it to the six months, that, the, that we may go longer than that because the moratorium may end. Keep in mind the moratorium technically has not started because it only begins with the first meeting and the first meeting has not yet been held. Right. And then it's only after consideration of those findings. So indeed it truly may be that the moratorium, six month moratorium, which what we're now, what's May 20th, I think was when it was first announced, uh, is going to be much longer than that. Right. And even if, depending on when we start this date, at the end of six months, it's probably not likely that you'll have a flash cut into moving right after the six months. There may be another permitting process that will go anywhere from 90 to 120 days more than that that are going to create um, additional delays in bringing more rigs back online. So those will create employment impacts as well. Okay. Um, and just so I think there's a misconception that this moratorium is going after Tony Hayward. But could, in the sense that it's the BP chief executive who's suffering from this, and he may be, um, he wants his life back. Um, on the other hand, those aren't the folks I know in South Louisiana, South Mississippi, and Texas who work on these rigs. Um, can, you tip, can you describe the type of job that we're talking about? Um, anything from technical positions of tool pushers and people that are involved in the day in, day in and day out uh, drilling operations, uh, engineering jobs, uh, service jobs that will come out and provide catering services that will provide uh, fluid, uh, fluids, drilling fluids, uh, other types of uh, support equipment that's needed, rentals equipment. Uh, marine transport back and forth to the boats. There are a wide variety of people that service this industry from the, from the, from the shoreline. So working class, middle class, and uh, folks, and, and small business people? Prob primarily, particularly in the service end of the business where you have a lot of, uh, of, of homegrown businesses in Louisiana, a large portion of those activities being there in the service bases uh, along the coast. Now I think of service base, for example, you mentioned catering, as being fairly cash flow dependent. Have you all done any analysis of how these small businesses will do if this moratorium stretches out? Uh, they're going to have to, they'll have to find other opportunities or they'll have to start shutting down um, operations and laying people off. So the jobs moratorium, as somebody calls it back home, could truly be a jobs moratorium? It, it could result in significant job losses and it is of a great concern for the state right now. Hmm. I yield back. I thank the uh, ranking member, and now I'd like to recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Capps. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. It is my conviction that every phase of the offshore drilling, exploration, development, and production can result in significant impacts to the environment. And that's why I believe the Interior Department should prepare an EIS, an environmental impact statement, at every phase of the drilling process. 
We've made some gains in this area in the Pacific region, for example. A seismic surveys off the coast of Santa Barbara require a separate env environmental review. I believe this is a good step to ensure meaningful opportunity for public particip participation in the OCS review process. Ms. Searles Jones, do you agree that requiring more in depth environmental reviews would provide decision makers with critical information concerning potential significant impacts from drilling? Congresswoman Caps, absolutely. One of the problems with the current OCS statutory scheme, which this discussion draft takes some great strides in addressing, is that decisions are made at such a great level of remove that commit us to a course of action that by the time we get to the ability to do any site-specific meaningful analysis that is full and fair, that is, it considers a range of alternatives that displays all of that information for the decision maker and for the public, uh, that really doesn't happen. The exploration stage, the exploration permit is when that should ha to happen. The current law requires the Minerals Management Service to approve permits within 30 days after the agency has deemed it to be submitted. The agency's course of practice has been to not start any environmental analysis until after it has deemed the exploration plan as submitted, and so it basically has created a situation where it feels like it only has 30 days to make that yeah. decision. And sometimes the lease sale analysis that has preceded the exploration plan is on the order of tens of millions of acres, which is not a meaningful scale of analysis, and we really can't display the effects. We can't have a discussion about what the consequences might be. The decision maker is denied information that it needs to actually make a good decision. and so. That is one of the key features that this uh, discussion draft advances that kind of analysis. Thank you. That very detailed. Let me follow up. As the President has noted, one necessary outcome of BP's oil spill must entail lessening our reliance on fossil fuels and facilitating the implementation of a clean energy policy. This is a long-term goal. When the Department prepares an EIS for offshore drilling, do you think it is a good idea to require a range of alternatives, including conservation, efficiencies, and renewable sources of energy uh, 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 that are capable of avoiding or minimizing the impacts of that drilling? That's a great question. And I think two things that this discussion draft starts to do that we could do a little bit better uh, is to make these decisions and make these considerations not just about oil and gas exploitation, but more broadly about energy production and how we're actually going to meet our energy needs, and to expand the range of alternatives to actually consider the effects on other sectors. There is some language in the discussion draft that moves toward um, considering other types of resources as you're doing um, the assessments, and I think that's a very positive thing. Ultimately, every commission that's ever looked at ocean governance has said we have to move away from single sector by sector by sector management when you are in a single sector statute like OXLA, uh, Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act, it would be a significant advance to have that kind of consideration of a broad range of alternatives that includes different types of energy development as well and understands um, what the trade offs are in making an OCS decision, for example, for renewable siting. Right. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to request that this witness be. Uh, charged with uh, expanding on those thoughts in writing to submit to the record for, for the purposes of this hearing, uh, if it's your wish. Yeah, hearing no objections, so ordered. Thank you. And I see the yellow light is on. I have a couple more questions which I could ask now, or could I could just press on, if you don't mind, Mr. Ranking Member. The, um, the department should be, I, in my opinion, the department should be required to assess the response and spill capacity for various spill scenarios in the environmental review, review process. Now, what, as we have seen on all too clearly, most cleanup efforts are only 10 to 15 percent effective. I saw that with the boom that was laid in 1969 and off the Santa Barbara coast. The same uh, effects we're seeing with the kind of spill response that is currently going on. Uh, uh, today, um, requiring an analysis is critical to ensure that the public and decision makers are not misled into believing that spills can be effectively cleaned up if they really can't. Um, this CLEAR Act does require a thorough analysis of the impacts associated with various cleanup me methodologies. Now, here's my particular question to you, which may need to be elucidated a little bit more in this bill. 
do you agree that these impacts must be addressed up front? And it, um, up front is the operative word, not after a spill occurs, so that only though not only those methods that will uh, so that uh, those methods that will avoid uh, exacerbating skill impacts uh, impacts are allowed. In other words, we should be clear ahead of time about which spill cleanup uh, methods are appropriate in in which scenarios. I think that's absolutely true. One of the uh, clearest lessons learned uh, with the Deepwater Horizon disaster is that we were not prepared. We did not have a spill response plan. We did not have adequate response capability. The states are in an exceedingly difficult situation uh, because the spill re response plan simply did not deal with a disaster of this magnitude. It is also true that our our technological approaches to actually dealing with oil spills are very limited, and they haven't changed much since the Exxon Valdez days. So we're yeah, doing absolutely. the same things we were doing back in the Exxon Valdez, and with Exxon Valdez, we only recovered about 10 percent of the oil. Right. And so the reality is once it's in the water, we have a very limited set of tools to deal with it. Um, and it is absolutely our view that we should have to demonstrate in a re under real world conditions that we are actually capable of dealing with a worst case spill before we actually go ahead and, and do uh, exploration and, and, and production. If I could um, ask a question at a different level now, should federal, the fed, federal government provide additional technical and financial resources to assist coastal states for their oil spill planning, logistics, response and recovery? Getting to the point that some of these, uh, some of the particularities, as I mentioned about what's required in, in California now with our seismic uh, studies that are required up front, should, should there be a, a, both a requirement and also the resources for doing it to, uh, to particular states and regions that they could implement specific requests? Absolutely. And then finally, and thank you for your indulgence, Madam Chair. Why is the Gulf of Mexico Restoration Program, which is not intended to supplant the existing natural resource damage assessment process, why is this program important to understanding the chronic impacts of this oil spill? That's a good question. I think one thing that would be useful in the, the discussion draft would be to clarify the relationship of the restoration program in the bill with the existing restoration work that will happen under the Oil uh, Pollution Act of 1990, the existing natural resource damage assessment process. We are witnessing um, an oil spill of a scale that we have never confronted before. We have a lot of lessons that we can learn from the Exxon Valdez, but the reality is this is a completely new situation. We've never uh, applied this volume of dispersants before. We have a lot of different habitat types up and down the coast, from sandy beaches to marshes. The restoration effort will be um, very long term, will require a lot of resources, and a constant monitoring and evaluation of that process is very important. And that's one of the other things that this bill helps do. Prevention is the most important thing, but once oil gets in the water, if you don't have good information about your baseline conditions, restoration is much more difficult. Um, so I, I, I think this bill does a lot of good things to both work on the prevention side, but also try to make the restoration side a little bit more uh, possible. Thank you. I do want okay. to find out, where, at what point would the baseline be made? Would that be uh, it, it, part of, the re, uh, of legislation, this legislation, or would that be up to the, the Gulf of Mexico Restoration Program? If my memory is correct in terms of where the sections are in here, there is a provision in here that is part of the Outer Continental Shelf Lands mm -hmm. Act amendment. That is that a baseline. require yeah. some baseline collection. Thank you very much. I thank the gentlelady from uh, California. Now I'd like to recognize the uh, ranking member, Mr. Cassidy. Ms. Jones, um, I know you didn't intend to, but there's oftentimes a kind of confusion where people suggest that renewable energy, as in they typically mean solar and windmills, which provides electricity, can in some way supplant transportation fuel, which is typically fossil fuel. Um, now, are you suggesting that we can supplant our transportation requirements with renewables? It is undeniable right now, Congressman Cassidy, that our economy is heavily dependent on fossil fuels. Um, it is also undeniable that fossil fuels are ultimately a finite resource and that there are significant... Yes, but that, that peak oil concept, if you will, has been continually disproven in the sense that we continue to have more oil discovered, more natural gas discovered. And so we are 
I accept that it's finite in the sense that everything is finite except maybe God, except definitely God. On the other hand, there still seems, um, uh, there, st there still seems to be, you know, a heck of a lot more than we thought there was. And let me be clear. I, I appreciate your perspective. I don't think that anyone on this committee thinks, well, I actually don't know this is true, but I would suspect that no one on this committee thinks that investments in renewables is a bad idea and ultimately looking at the long term that that is the future of domestic energy production. Given our relative consumption rates and our production rates, clearly we need to invest on alternative forms of energy as well. I appreciate what you say about uh, this being a fossil fuel based economy and I think that's part of the challenge for us is how as a nation, do we turn a little bit and turn the corner toward having a more diverse and renewable energy portfolio so that we can actually but, but even if we say that currently windmills and solar provides about 1 percent of our electrical grid and almost none of our transportation needs, there's a few electric cars, but that's about it, and there is a big dead zone off the mouth of the Mississippi from fertilizer coming down from the Mississippi, down, down the Mississippi, uh, and that dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico is related to fertilizers used to grow corn to make ethanol. Uh, I'm a little dubious about the renewables for transportation fuel. Your thoughts? <laughs> I am not a transportation fuel renewables expert, but I would observe that part of what we need to do is to grapple more broadly with that energy policy question. But there's and actually I a dichotomy, isn't there, between electricity and transportation? And again, we often blur that line. We speak about renewables. We typically mean, again, biomass or windmills or solar. But that has almost no relationship at all to uh, transportation needs. I would agree that that has almost no relationship right now to the way our transportation system currently operates. But necessity is the mother invention. And part of what I think is that if we invest more in different forms of technology, um, electric cars, hybrid cars, there are other alternatives out there, and they are worthy of pursuit. Dr. Desmukes, this CLEAR Act has a really kind of novel concept. If a, state if a state declares a moratorium on offshore drilling, then the federal waters are off limits, meaning that effectively the state owns a federal resource. If you happen to live in Oregon or um, someplace else, I'm specifically not saying Louisiana, <laughs> You own that. And you can tell the people in Kansas, even though your tax dollars are otherwise flowing and flowing, nonetheless, we own it and we can deny you access, except for Louisiana. I'm struck by that, and I like your perspective on this. In Louisiana, we generate all this Gulf of Mexico activity, and yet the money is spread out across the nation. So it's kind of like what is theirs is theirs and what ours is there, if I want to speak of it from a Louisiana perspective. What would be your thoughts on Well, on that? I, I would agree. Uh, certainly there is an inconsistency in that policy. Uh, I do think that states should have some say-so over the activities that occur off their shoreline. Uh, there should be some sharing in that activity between the federal government and the state governments, but I don't think that there has been historically that fair sharing relationship as it relates to the offshore energy production that has occurred to date in the Gulf of Mexico, particularly as it relates to the Gulf states. Um, you see those types of provisions for onshore production and mining on federal lands where you have at least 50-50 sharing relationships and when the reclamation dollars come back they are far in excess of 50 percent going back to the states and yet you don't have those same kind of relationships for the Gulf Coast states for all the energy production that they do. And not only just the energy production that's offshore, but all the supporting infrastructure that's onshore that provides all the gasoline and the natural gas and the gas transportation and the gas processing, all the petrochemical uh, facilities that are in the state that make these plastic bottles, that make the plastic that go on to the name tags that are here, and all the other infrastructure, the, 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 the refined product pipelines that originate in the area, all the other aspects that are there because of that energy production. And so you don't have to comment on what I'm about to say. The tyranny of the federal government is on the boot of our roustabouts and rig workers denying them the opportunity to work for something which has no scientific basis if you listen to the National Academy of Engineering. And it's also on the boot of our state uh, in the sense that it, it allows other states, at least this bill, to effectively have control over their federal resources, but it doesn't accord the same to us. It continues to put in a, more, a job moratorium, which we would object to, on the grounds that it's their right. It seems like a bad deal for Louisiana. <laughs> uh, I yield back. Thank you. I thank the uh, gentleman, and I'd like to thank the two witnesses, and I do apologize for the long time you spent here in the hearing room. We, we had votes, and so I thank you for your patience. And I would also uh, 
like to remind you that the hearing record will be open for 10 days. Uh, the members of the committee may have additional questions, so uh, please be advised and we hope that you can answer them in a timely manner. Uh, without further business here, the uh, full committee of natural resources now stands adjourned. Solicitor General Elena Kagan wrapped up her testimony Wednesday afternoon in her Supreme Court confirmation hearings. But the Senate Judiciary Committee is back Thursday at 4.